Brooklyn, New York. Thank you very much for that very warm welcome, sisters and brothers, comrades all. May I start off, sisters and brothers, by bringing to you warm, fraternal greetings from the free people of revolutionary Grenada. And may I also, right at this very beginning, say how very, very pleasant it is to be back in New York among you, to be in this great hall where there are so many hundreds of our sisters and brothers. That is going to bring a great deal of pleasure to our free people, and I will certainly report your warmth your enthusiasm, and your revolutionary support for our process when I return. <laughs> of course, we are here among friends. But looking around, there are two people here who are right now representing their country at the United Nations, people who are involved in liberation struggles, people who are struggling for their national liberation, for justice, for freedom for their countries, freedom for their peoples. It is very important right at the beginning, sisters and brothers, that we acknowledge the presence of Dr. Terzi the representative to the United Nations of the People's Liberation Organization, the PLO. Dr. Terzi can be assured, as always, that the people of Palestine and their sole authentic representatives, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, will always have the firm support of the fraternal people of the world. The South African racists who have spent so much time inventing all sorts of ingenious ways of oppressing the people of South Africa, the black majority, who have spent so much time in ensuring that those people are not able to reclaim their true patrimony. They are now discovering that in common with all of the national liberation movements around the world that are forced to move to the highest stage of the struggle that the African National Congress is also willing to make that step. In saluting the Deputy Permanent Representative of the ANC to the United Nations, let us ask him to bring back to his people, to bring back to his organization, to bring back to Oliver Tambo, to bring back to Nelson Mandela, whose spirit is here with us. to bring back to all of his people and to his revolutionary organization the love, the respect, the concern, the admiration, and the fraternal feelings of all of us to the people of South Africa. <laughs> Brother David and Dava.
The last time I had the opportunity, sisters and brothers, comrades, of being in New York and addressing our Grenadian nationals, other people from the Caribbean and Latin America, and of course, the people of the United States in New York, was four years ago, as our ambassador to the United Nations has said. Since those four years have passed, a lot has happened in our country. A lot has happened in the world. And one of the reasons at this time that we have come to the United States, in fact, is to be able to share our experiences of the last four years with the people of the United States. We were anxious to do this because, of course, there has been a major campaign over the last several weeks and months, starting from last year, November, with some remarks by the Vice President in Miami, continuing with more remarks from the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, the Admiral of the Fleet, and then the President himself. <laughs> and in all of these remarks and allegations, different allegations were made against our country. And therefore, we were particularly happy, comrades, to have had the opportunity of an invitation from TransAfrica, the organization based in Washington that has been doing a lot of lobbying for Africa and the Caribbean. We were invited to come to address their sixth annual dinner last night. And that was a very successful event and we want to publicly thank TransAfrica once again for making this visit possible. The Congressional Black Caucus, too, was involved as co-sponsors of this visit, and we also want to place our appreciation on the record. Of course, we set ourselves other objectives once the visit was definitely confirmed. And these objectives included the very important objective of trying to see what we could do to deepen and strengthen the people-to-people -people relations which have always existed between our two countries, Grenada and the United States. At the level of the people, there has never been any problem. At the level of the people, we have always had excellent relations with the people of the United States. In fact, as you know, in some years, more American tourists come to our country than the entire population of the country. <laughs> and on top of that, there is a medical school in Grenada. And at this medical school, over 700 young Americans are earning their right to become doctors, are getting the career in Free Grenada. So from our point of view, clearly bad relations do not make sense. From our point of view, the need to deepen ties the need to ensure that even more American visitors come to our country every year is a critical and burning need. And another objective was to try yet again to establish some form of official contact and official dialogue with the government of the United States. We, of course, cannot decide which government is going to be in power in the United States at any given moment in time. That is a matter for the people of the United States. And whoever happens to be in power at a particular time, we believe it is extremely important for us to maintain normal relations so that we are able to conduct proper dialogue in a civilized fashion.
There is a need for some kind of mechanism to be established. And that is why we have been struggling so hard over all of these years to try to get some of the basic norms reestablished. Let us exchange ambassadors, we have said. They have rejected that. So we have no ambassador accredited to Washington because they refuse to accept the credentials of the ambassador we have suggested. When they replaced their ambassador after the electoral victory of President Reagan in 1980 and the new ambassador came out in 1981, he was not, in fact, accredited to Grenada. So we have to talk, presumably, using loudspeakers. <laughs> and even when we write letters, like I did, for example, in 1981 on two occasions to President Reagan, in March and again in August. First letter, short letter, making the simple, obvious point. Look, you are a new president. We had hoped that as a new president, you would have taken a new look at the situation, that you would have been anxious to start off on as good relations as you can with all countries around the world. We had hoped that you, therefore, would have wanted relations normalized. And we went on in that letter to make the point that what we are saying is the true bottom line is dialogue. It is talks. Therefore, let us get these talks going. We are proposing no agenda with any preconditions. Let us look at all questions. Let us put them all on the table. Let us see what you perceive as problems we will tell you what we perceive as problems. Let us see if in the course of those discussions we can narrow down differences so at least the new beginning that is made will be begun on a basis of mutual understanding with less distrust and less suspicion. No reply to that letter. So the fact is, sisters and brothers, we have had this long, long history of trying to see in what ways relations could be normalized, of working very hard at trying to get some form of dialogue going, and we have had very little success in this regard. But I really want to say tonight that we do believe it is important for us to continue that struggle. And therefore, notwithstanding the difficulties in the way, we deem it very advisable for us to continue to press for a full normalization of relations. But of course, as we press for normalization, we are also going to continue to build our revolution. We are also going to continue to consolidate our process. In the face of all of the difficulties, in the face of all of the economic destabilization, the political, diplomatic, and military threats and pressure, we don't intend to roll over and play like an ostrich. We are going to stand on our feet and keep going forward. And as you know, sisters and brothers, in these times, it is becoming more and more difficult for developing third world countries to go forward. Because unfortunately, our economies remain by and large dependent on and tied to the capitalist world economies. And therefore, when the capitalist world goes through their cyclical crises, one after the other, it has an immediate effect on us. As we say at home, when the capitalist world catches a cold, we catch pneumonia. <laughs> and the crisis in the capitalist world has been deep. In all of the developed industrialized countries, there is greater and greater unemployment. And as this unemployment goes deeper and deeper into the society, the people who feel it the most are the poor and working people, the massive cutbacks. <laughs> the 
the massive cuts in social welfare, the cuts are not coming in the arms race. The cuts are not coming out of the arms budget. I understand the talk is to spend $3 trillion over five years. The mind boggles. That is the kind of money that is supposed to be consumed in arms. But while that kind of money is being consumed in arms, hospitals are closing down. Jobs are being, more and more retrenchment is taking place. Pensions are being reduced. Medic, medic aid is being reduced. In other words, the arms is swallowing up the money. The people are not benefiting. But the effect this has had on us in turn, countries of the developing world, has been to also create a crisis in the developing world. In the developing world as a whole, it is now estimated that our debts exceed $650 billion. That is how much money we owe collectively. Just servicing of debts alone is causing massive problems for the countries of the third world. Last year, $131 billion was spent on the countries of the third world in just servicing their debt, just paying the interest, not one cent back on the capital. And that took $131 billion. But on top of that, we are also discovering that it is becoming more and more difficult to engage in trade with the countries of the Western industrialized world. But even as they make it more difficult for us to trade with them, the whole question of aid, which at one time used to be regarded as a kind of duty that the developed capitalist world, the developed industrialized world had, if duty it was, that duty has virtually disappeared. Because the reality is that aid has also decreased quite dramatically for third world countries. But not satisfied with all of that, what they have now done after cutting off aid, cutting off trade, cutting off investment, making it virtually impossible to get money through the international financial institutions, now they are forcing more and more third world countries to go directly to the international capital market, to the big commercial banks, to get loans. But the reality is that by forcing us more and more to have to go to the international capital market, the debt trap is intensified even more. And while all of this is going on, sisters and brothers, there are so many people in the world who are unemployed, so many people in the world who are going hungry to bed hungry every single night. So many millions in the third world who are illiterate and whose governments either do not care or feel they cannot do anything to solve that problem. Unemployment, hunger, malnutrition, disease, illiteracy. These are the crimes and the sins that have visited upon the poor developing countries of the third world while the industrialized countries continue to exploit our resources and to keep the profits. But yet, sisters and brothers, in the face of all of that, the Grenada Revolution has nonetheless continued to go forward and to make progress. <laughs> At a time when even the big, powerful, industrialized nations were growing backwards last year, we grew forward by 5.5%.
the revolution in Grenada, starting from a base from Gary of 49% unemployment, coming from that base, when we did a census last year, April 1982, the unemployment rate had dropped from 49% to down to 14.2%. The last year of Gary, 1978, the capital investment program was $8 million. The first year of the revolution, that figure was more than doubled. It went to $16 million. The second year of the revolution, it was doubled again. It went to $39.9 million. And by this time, the experts were saying, that is impossible. You don't have the resources. You don't have the management. You don't have enough tractors. You don't have enough trucks. You don't have enough engineers. You can't possibly do it. You all were only lucky in 1979 when you doubled Gary own. And you're only lucky in 1980 again when you doubled your own. And then when we went to 1981 and we doubled it again, they say, well, we don't know if it's luck, but something is wrong. You all can't do that again. And then last year in 1982, it went up to over 100 million. And then we gave them the secret. We told them that in a revolution, things operate differently in the normal situation. We have been able to make these accomplishments because in Grenada, consistent with our three pillars of the revolution, where the first pillar of the revolution is our people, who are always at the center and heart and focus of all of our activities, we are able to mobilize and organize the people to cut out waste, to cut out corruption, to stamp on inefficiency, to move to planning, to look out for production, to check on productivity, to make sure that state enterprises are not set up to be subsidized, but that state enterprises too must become viable, must make a profit, and therefore the state sector will then have the surplus to bring the benefits. We have been able to pull our people into the whole economic process. And our people have gladly been pulled into the economic process because our people see the benefits which the revolution has brought to them. They understand that when 37 cents out of every dollar is spent on health and education, that means something. In this country, the figure is probably nearer to 10 cents on every dollar. Because today in Grenada, the money that the people of Grenada used to have to spend, for example, when they went to a doctor or a dentist, that money they no longer have to spend because they now have free health care throughout the system. Our people understand the value and the benefit of free secondary education because they know now that once their children are able to pass the common entrance exam and get into secondary school, they no longer have to worry about finding those fees, which as you know for agricultural workers, for example, were very often impossible. But not just free secondary education, but in effect, free university education. <laughs> Moving from a situation before the revolution, where in the last year of Gary, 1978, just three people went abroad on university scholarships. And they happened to be Gary's daughter and one of his other minister's daughter. 
Moving from that situation, in the first six months of the revolution, 109 students were able to go abroad on free university scholarships. Our people are more and more getting to understand what we mean when we say that education to us is liberation. That education is a strategic concern of this government. That is why that this year, 1982, is the year we have named the year of political and academic education, because we understand the importance of bringing education to our people. Following the establishment of the Center for Popular Education program in early 1980, within one year of the work of the CPE program, the illiteracy figure in Grenada was reduced to 2% of the entire population. The people understand that in areas, in all areas of their basic needs, real attempts are being made to solve these problems. Two and a half million gallons more of water, pie bone water, are flowing into the homes of our Grenadians at this time. Before the revolution, under 30% of all homes had portable water. The people understand what it means when electrification is brought to their village. The people understand what it means when they know that by the end, the middle of next year, we would have doubled the electricity output and capacity in our country. And therefore, more people would have the possibility of electricity. Our people, therefore, sisters and brothers, have a greater and deeper understanding of what the revolution means and what it has brought to them. They certainly understand very, very clearly that when some people attack us on the ground of human rights, when some people attack us on the ground of constituting a threat to the national security of other countries, our people understand that is foolishness they know the real reason has to do with the fact of the revolution and the benefits that the revolution are bringing to the people of our country. The real reason for all of this hostility is because some perceive that what is happening in Grenada can lay a new socio-economic and political path of development. They give all kinds of reasons and excuses, some of them credible, some utter rubbish. There's an interesting one that we saw very recently in a secret report of the State Department. I want to tell you about that one. So you can reflect on that one. That secret report made this point, that Grenada is different to Cuba and Nicaragua. And the Grenada Revolution is, in one sense, even worse, I'm using their language, than the Cuban and Nicaraguan revolutions, because the people of Grenada and the leadership of Grenada speaks English, and therefore can communicate directly to the people of the United States. <laughs> I can see from your applause, sisters and brothers, that you agree with the report. <laughs> but I want to tell you what that same report also said, and said that also made us very dangerous. And that is that the people of Grenada and the leadership of Grenada are predominantly black.
They said that 95% of our population is black, and they had a correct statistic. And if we have 95% of predominantly African origin in our country, then we can have a dangerous appeal to 30 million black people in the United States. Now, that aspect of the report clearly is one of the more sensible ones. <laughs> but, sisters and brothers, how do we evaluate other sides of the report? Like when they say that Grenada violates human rights. When they say to us, how come you have detainees? What about the press? What about elections? When they say to us, where are your elections? They don't turn around at the same time and say to their friends in South Africa, where are your elections? When they say to us that elections must be held, and if you don't have elections, then you can't expect support. And unless you have elections, then we can't give you the normal treatment. We say, Salvador Allende of Chile. Salvador Allende of Chile was elected in September 1970 by the people of Chile. Allende did not take power through a revolution. Allende did not form a militia. Allende did not grab any land or property. Allende had no political detainees. Allende did not crush the press. He did not close down the parliament. He did not suspend the Constitution. He played by every rule they wrote, but they killed him still. <laughs> These people understand very well that a revolution means a new situation. Revolution means that the abuses and excesses of the violent, reactionary, and disruptive minority has to be crushed so that the majority interest can prevail. When the Americans had their revolution in 1776, it took them 13 years to call their election. They talk about detainees, but when the American Revolution came in 1776, 600,000 people were detained in this country. 100,000 Americans in the first week of the American Revolution, 100,000 fled to Canada. Thousands were locked up without charge or trial. Hundreds were shot. And the counter-revolutionaries after the American Revolution, 
They had no right to vote. They had no right to teach. They had no right to preach. They had no right to a job. Their land was confiscated without payment. So when the falsifiers of history try to pretend that the American Revolution was a Boston Tea Party, was a very bloody Tea Party. That's something that very often happens in all revolutions, the spontaneous upheaval of the masses did not really happen in Grenada. A church-based organization in Washington called Epica wrote a book last year on Grenada. They called it Grenada, the peaceful revolution. We can understand why. So when these elements come and make these statements, we understand only too well where they are coming from. They understand that in Grenada, no one is ever interfered with for what he says. No one is ever interfered with for what he writes. In fact, today, criticism is deeper than ever in the society in a constructive way. But our people also understand that the first law of the revolution is that a revolution must survive, must consolidate, so more benefits can come to them. And because of this fact, the revolution has laid down as a law that nobody, regardless of who you are, will be allowed to be involved in any activity surrounding the overthrow of the government by the use of armed violence. And anyone who moves in that direction will be ruthlessly crushed. But we also feel, sisters and brothers, that the time has in fact come for us to make another step along the way towards institutionalizing the process that we have been building for four years. And that is why only yesterday in Grenada, the new chairman of the Constitutional Commission arrived in our capital city, St. George's, from Trinidad and Tobago to announce the formation of the Constitutional Commission that has now undertaken the task of drafting a new constitution for our young revolution. <laughs> this constitution is not really going to look like the one that the Queen gave us <laughs> in 1974. This time wrong, this constitution is going to come out of the bowels of our people and out of our earth. Our people will have their inputs and will decide what they want to see go into that constitution. Our new constitution also is certainly going to institutionalize and entrench the systems of popular democracy which we have been building over these past four years in our country. Because to us, democracy is much, much more than just an election. To us, democracy is a great deal more than just the right to put an X next to Tweedledum name or Tweedledee name every five years. But democracy also means, and to us it has five integrated components. First, accountability. People have to account to those who elect them. People. The second principle of democracy to us, responsibility. We don't believe in Grenada in presidents for life. 
or elected people for life. We believe in service for life. And when you stop serving, you must be recalled and get out of the way for somebody else to serve. The third principle. To us, the third principle of democracy is participatory mechanisms, popular participation. If we are serious about democracy, and here I will accept the definition, the well-known definition of Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln said of democracy that it is government of, for, and by the people. I accept that. It's a good definition. <laughs> but if it is government of, for, and by the people, then it cannot be just government of the people you elect. It also has to be for them, and it also has to be by them. They have to have a way of participating. That is what the word by means. And if that is absent, you don't really have the democracy. We believe that it is very important for the people to have a voice in running their affairs. The ways in which we have approached this question over these years is basically twofold. One, the creation of mass organizations of our people. The National Women's Organization, the National Youth Organization, the Farmers Union, and of course, the labor unions, the trade unions. Not only were the women of our country without work before the revolution, the women of our country were also the most harassed and victimized of any section of our population. Those few who were granted jobs from time to time, many of them were given those jobs only on the basis of a sexual favor. So women were being sexually exploited in return for jobs. The very first decree of the revolution was to outlaw sexual victimization and exploitation of our women in return for jobs. And going on from that, sisters and brothers, the revolution then passed a law applying to all workers in the public sector of equal pay for equal work for all of the women in the public sector in our country. We also then passed another law more recently, a maternity leave law. And by this maternity leave law, every woman who is pregnant must be granted three months maternity leave, two months with full pay, one could be without full pay, and a guarantee of return to employment after the pregnancy. And it is because of these laws and because of the new environment in the country that so many women have begun to step forward, have begun to assert themselves, have begun to go out and find new jobs, have begun to get fully involved in production. And that is why, too, so many of them have joined their mass organization, so that today, at this point in time, one in every three adult women woman over the age of 16 years is a member of the National Women's Organization. So within our mass organizations, the principle of electability is already entrenched. And for our people in general, there have been some organs of popular democracy that have been built. Zonal councils, parish councils, worker parish councils, farmer councils where the people come together from month to month and the usual agenda would be a report on programs taking place in the village. Then there would be a report usually by some senior member of the bureaucracy. It might be the manager of the Central Water Commission or it might be the manager of the telephone company or the electricity company. And this senior bureaucrat has to go there and report to the people 
on his area of work and then be submitted to a question and answer session. So this concept of democracy and our approach to human rights is one that has stressed the solving of these problems and the involvement of our people in a participatory way from day to day and week to week. They have also raised over and over again the question of our relations with Cuba as a second one of these red herrings they throw up. We say, first of all, that yes, we have warm, fraternal relations with the government and people of Cuba. That is true. We see Cuba as part of our Caribbean family of nations. One of the greatest curses of colonialism was that they, they divided the region according to different metropolitan centers. They taught us different languages, and then they made a great play of the fact that you are Dutch-speaking, you are Spanish-speaking, you are French-speaking, you are English-speaking, and more recently, you are American-speaking. And based on this linguistic nonsense, they taught us to hate each other. But the fact of the matter is that they come down, they tell us if you're speaking Dutch, you're the best. If it's English, you're the best. French is the best. Spanish is the best. American is the best. And all of us hating each other. When in fact we are one people from one Caribbean with one struggle and one destiny. We see it, therefore, as one of our historic duties and responsibilities to pull down these artificial barriers of colonialism and to develop that oneness and that unity that we nearly lost. We believe it is critically necessary to have close relations with all of our neighbors. But there is also a third reason that we will always have relations warm, fraternal, close relations with the people of the government of Cuba. And that is our admiration and our respect for the internationalism and the achievements of the Cuban people. Whether they like it or not, Cuban internationalist soldiers have been the first in the world to charge the racist South African monster and to face them with arms in their hand while defending Angola. If there were no Cuban internationalist troops in Angola, how long ago would a South African apartheid monster have overrun Angola with the assistance of several Western powers? They can choose their South African and their Haitian and Chilean and South Korean and every piece of dictator friends they wish, that is okay. But we can't choose our friends. 
because we're too small and poor to have the rights to choose. They like to talk a lot about backyard and front yard and lake. Grenada in nobody backyard and in part of nobody lake. The more desperate that imperialism gets, the more it comes up with the most vulgar and hostile measures to try to keep the poor, oppressed people of the world who are trying to win their national liberation and to build their own future down. Think of Nicaragua. Nicaragua country invaded over the years, two, three times in this century by the United States. Nicaragua, a country that has been under the brutal heel of the Somozas for over 45 years. Nicaragua, a country that just like the Americans 200 years ago, finally resorted to their supreme right to overthrow their repressors and murderers and to take their destiny into their own hands. And when the people of Nicaragua, when the sons and daughters of Sandino assume their liberation, when they won in July of 79, what was the crime that they committed thereafter? Their crime was to be bold and mannish and fresh enough to say that their resources belong to them to say that they want to build their country in their own way, to say that they want to choose their own friends, to say that they are going to build their country after their own image and likeness and not after the image and likeness of somebody else. And because of that, you have this situation where today, in the most vulgar, shameless act of the last year or so, can only pale into comparison when you put it against what is happening in El Salvador, or when you place it against what happened in the middle of last year in Lebanon, when the Palestinian people were slaughtered. The most vulgar, shameless act of open CIA activity in their country. The most open, vulgar, shameless act of even admitting that not only will they resort to covert actions, but if necessary, they will publicly back overt action against the Nicaraguans. The shamelessness of it is really extraordinary. And perhaps the only good thing that has come out of this recent episode, sisters and brothers, is the fact that for the first time in a long time, the people of Latin America themselves have tried to find a solution to the problem. That has been the historic meaning of the get-together of Venezuela, Colombia, Mexico, and Panama on Contadora to launch the Contadora Initiative. Because what this Contadora Initiative is all about is really extremely important for us. It says, first of all, that we, the people of Latin America and the Caribbean, will try to solve our problems ourselves. It says, secondly, that we do not accept the use of violence as a means of settling our disputes. And it says, fourthly, that we are not prepared to accept 
that any country in our region, far less any country outside our region, has the right to interfere in the internal affairs of another country. But these people have also thrown out another allegation against Grenada. This other allegation concerns the question of our international airport project. This one is, of course, the most comical one of all. <laughs> According to the formulators of this famous theory, Grenada's international airport is now going to become a military base and will now become a strategic jump-off point from where we can launch an attack on the great, big, powerful, mighty United States. <laughs> it looks like if we have become a superpower. <laughs> but the reality of the airport, of course, is well known to all those who make those statements. This airport is an ancient dream of the people of our country. This international airport has undergone a quarter century of studies. All previous governments from 1955 have spoken about the need for the airport. And if you understand the situation in our country, that would be no surprise to anybody. The present airport is called Pearls. Pearls has a strip 5,500 feet long. That means only little turboprop planes can come in. The turboprop planes that come in carry a maximum of 48 passengers. And better still, these planes could only land during the day between 6 and 6 because there are no night lights. The question of the length of the strip, the basis on which we had to make a strip of 9,000 feet is because all of the manuals that were done by European and American companies, I can think of McDonnell Douglas, people who do the DC-8 and so on. I can think of the Boeings. They have produced manuals saying what length of strip is required if their planes are to land. So unless we born big and stupid, you can't expect us to put down a strip that planes that can carry people, normal jet planes, we won't be able to use. So the fact of the matter is the 9,000 feet was dictated by the necessity for that. This international project, as we see it, is the gateway to our future. As we see it, it is what alone can give us the potential for economic takeoff. As we see it, can help us to develop the tourist industry more, can help us to develop our agro-industries more, can help us to export our fresh fruits and vegetables better. That is why we have made an exception this year. Usually every year at the end of December, we announce what the next year will be called you know, a year of education and production or whatever it is. But last month, six and a half months ahead of schedule, we announced to our people what the name of next year will be so they can start from now to mobilize, including mobilizing overseas around the name because 1984 next year will be called the year of the international airport. And the fact of the matter is, next year is also significant for us because on the 13th of March, 84, it will be the fifth anniversary of the revolution. And therefore, what we want to do during the fifth festival on the 13th of March itself is to open our international airport on that day. Long live the people of Free Grenada. Long live the workers, farmers, youth, and women of Free Grenada. Long live the people of the United States. Long live Grenada-US relations and friendship.
Long live the people of Cuba and Nicaragua. Long live the people of Angola and Mozambique. Long live. Okay, let me just first uh, apologize. Uh, first, for my voice, because I'm struggling with the cold a little bit. Uh, I did survive carnival, but the cold is not that to me. Uh, go free. So I have a bit of a sore throat, a bit of a cough, so I just need to apologize to the audience first for that. And of course, we were supposed to start at two, but we were just finalizing the tech, you know, all these technical things work, especially when you deal with Skype. Some days it work, and some days something stick, or something take a little while, and the person not hearing, so we have to just make sure we finalize those things before we get going. So let me ask everyone to, to stand and invite, let me invite Frank to just a word of prayer. Um, this afternoon is a, is a very special afternoon, and I really want to thank everyone who joined us on a Saturday evening. Saturday afternoons are never easy for anyone. So I think it's really for us to express our deep appreciation and gratitude that persons would have taken time of their Saturday afternoon to, to join us in recognizing a very important event. And we decided that this theme will be um, Never Forget because it's an event in our Caribbean history, in the history of developing people across the world actually, not just in the Caribbean, um, that that moment be recognized. And that we spend a little time this afternoon reflecting on the impact, uh, what it meant, and as well, its relevance even in today's geopolitical world. And we all know it's very relevant now when one considers what is happening to neighboring Venezuela. It's almost a uh, reminiscent of that period of the 70s and the 80s where there was interventions all across Latin America um, as well as other parts of Africa and Asia. So we are seeing that that type of politics playing itself out once again by our powerful neighbors to the north uh, right in our lifetime. For those of us who are not um, so young would we'll probably remember other lifetimes in particular the Grenada um, Revolution and then of course the subsequent invasion. I myself, uh, in 1979, I was five years old. I know I probably looked like I wasn't born yet. But <laughs> that's because I didn't hear from this morning. Huh? <laughs> but um, I was five years old. And, um, so I, I did not have a recollection of the actual beginning of the revolution. But what I do have a recollection of, because uh, four years later, I would have been nine, and the images that we saw coming across on television. Yeah. Um, and it was, would have been only much later on in my young adult life, my still continued young adult life. Um, I really appreciate what was happening in, in Grenada. And we think that it's, as we celebrate the 40th anniversary, uh, 13th of March 1979, 13th of March after it was just uh, when, I think it was Wednesday, 40 years later, 40 years on. We, uh, as progressive people, as, pro as a progressive movement, cannot, must not, not only must we not forget, we must ensure that others do not as well. And it is for this reason the Joint Trade Union Movement, as well as the Movement for Social Justice, collaborated and put together a small panel for us to recognize the 40th anniversary of the Grenadian Revolution, such a powerful and important revolution, um, and, and for us to share and sort of reminisce a little bit, but analyze what took place and place it even in today's context. I think that that is also important. The structure of the program is simple. We will have three powerful panelists, um, and I understand that there will be one or two interventions coming from the floor, and then we actually open it up for persons to ask questions, for persons to maybe share their experiences. Sometimes, right in the audience here, we will have persons who may have been impacted by what, has happened, by what happened in 1979 and 83. So it is an opportunity to share and for us to build uh, within our collective consciousness the aspirations and dreams of that very historic moment. I'd like to recognize the ambassador of Cuba to Trinidad and Tobago, new ambassador, um, that is Her Excellency Tania Diego Bolite, who's with us here this afternoon. And it's very interesting, of course, that uh, we have the presence of the Cuban ambassador because we all know um, Cuba and Grenada 
and Maurice Bishop in particular, were very, very, very close. And when we consider today's geopolitical scenario and the statements being made by um, the President to the North uh, concerning Cuba, because he's made several comments about Cuba to isolate Cuba even further, that I think it is very it is excellent that we have the presence of the Cuban ambassador here with us this afternoon and we'll be willing to share a few things as well. We also have a, but I saw her earlier, but we had an icon, national icon, poet, uh, Poland to spring up. I, I understand she just stepped back out to come back, so she, she will be joining us momentarily. And we do have uh, members of the MSG executive, we have Gregory Fernandez, the chairman, um, we have Melissa Aguilera, and we have Franca James who are with us. I saw the youth representative somewhere about uh, Angelo. Um, I'd also like to recognize from the trade union movement, we have the president of the Ultranidad General Workers Union, Nirvan Maraj. We have the um, president of the Trinidad and Tobago Business Association, Gidi Stewart. We have the secretary general of the Postal Workers Union, Comrade David Forbes, and we have two executive officers of the OWTU, Comrade Ram Singh, Chandra Singh Ram Singh, and of course, Comrade Ricky Benny, as well as some other officers. So, I, I hope I didn't forget anyone. Um, and of course, oh, yes, I did forget someone. Um, we have with us as well, uh, Comrade uh, Roberta Clark, who's here with us. Uh, thank you for being here this afternoon. Uh, of course, a long uh, fighter for women's rights. Uh, not just in Trinidad and Tobago, but throughout the Caribbean and has made significant contributions. So we're happy that you're here with us because as we analyze the revolution, the Grenadian revolution, you'll see that a lot of emphasis was placed on women's participation and so on. So it'll be interesting for us to have that uh, discourse. In my um, intro here, I would like to also say that I think that it's easy for us now to sometimes take for granted the truly historic moment, not just for Grenada, but for the Caribbean, in terms of what happened. Grenada was literally deciding its own path and its own destiny by breaking down some of the old vestiges of colonialism and was shifting from representative democracy to participatory democracy. Pre-revolutionary Grenada suffered from unemployment levels of upward of 50%. Through the development of cooperatives, the expansion of the industrial base, the diversification of agriculture, the expansion of the tourist industry, and the creation of massive public goods pro public programs, unemployment dropped to some 40%. And the percentage of food imports dropped from 40% to 28%, at a time when market prices for agricultural products were collapsing. Palo Freire, of course, uh, uh, Global and international intellectual in the field of education, revolutionary education, if you will, implement the design and led the implementation of a literacy program which saw the wiping out of the literacy. Literacy rate increased from 85% to 98%. By 1983, 37% of the national budget was being spent on education and health. That was the priority. School fees were abolished and schools were repaired. We have um, the revolution also strongly focused on women's empowerment and participation. The changes in the society, Grenada society, were reflected by a massively invigorated national culture expressed through calypso, poetry, dance, drama. It was almost like a renaissance. Organs of power, and this was critical, sprung up everywhere. Nearly everyone was involved in some level of organization and decision making in terms of zonal councils, the workers' parish councils, farmers' councils, the youth movement, or and even the women's movement, all of which had regular meetings once a month. This is just a snippet of what could be considered the achievements of the revolution in such a short space of time. So I do not want to spend much time opening. Uh, we have a panel of three very powerful speakers. Um, one such person, his name is Don Rojas, and I brought with me an old book that I found in my library, published around that time in the 1980s by Casa de las Americas in Cuba, actually. Um, it was edited by 
uh, Don Rojas himself who was the press secretary to Maurice Bishop during the time of the revolution. We also have another um, icon, I call uh, these persons national icons, um, who was part of building that revolutionary grenade. And we will hear from her in terms of the education, the attempt at revolutionary education in Grenada, that is none other than Comrade Mullen Hodge, and then we will hear from David Abdullah, political leader of the Movement for Social Justice, who was part of the trade union movement during those uh, exciting times, one may argue. Um, exciting, yes, but we also have to recognize the tragedy. And I think during this discussion over the next few hours, we would look at the achievements, but we will also have to be very brutally honest with ourselves and also analyze the tragedy. Um, before I do that, I just want to read very quickly an excerpt from this book that I found. And it is the first address to the nation on Radio Free Grenada on March 13th, 1979, 40 years ago, at 10 to a.m. And this is Maurice Bishop's first address to the nation. I will just read excerpts, and I'm going to read the quote of the speech. Brothers and sisters, well, I don't have Maurice Bishop's voice. I <laughs> But one can just imagine, then you can just imagine being uh, in Grenada at the time, turning on your radio at 10 to a.m. to hear these words. Brothers and sisters, this is Maurice Bishop speaking. At 4.15 a.m. this morning, the People's Revolutionary Army seized control of the army barracks at Trooper. The barracks were burned to the ground. After half an hour's struggle, the forces of Gary's army were completely defeated and surrendered. Every single soldier surrendered and not a single member of the revolutionary forces was injured. I am now calling upon the working people, the youths, workers, farmers, fishermen, middle class people, and women to join our armed revolutionary forces at central positions in your communities and to give them any assistance which they call for. People of Grenada, this revolution is for work, for food, for decent housing and health services, and for a bright future for our children and great-grandchildren. The benefit of the revolution will be given to everyone, regardless of political opinion or which political party they support. I am appealing to all the people, gather at all central places all over the country, and prepare to welcome and assist the people's armed forces when they come into your area. The revolution is expected to consolidate the position of power within the next few hours. Long live the people of Grenada. Long live freedom and democracy. Let us together build a just Grenada. Those were the words of Maurice Bishop on the 13th of March 1979 at 10.30 a.m. on Radio Free Grenada. So I will now invite our first panelist. This is um, from the United States. Uh, he will open the panel. As I said, he was the press secretary to Maurice Bishop, to Maurice Bishop during that revolutionary period. So, good afternoon, um, Mr. Rojas. Can you hear me? All right, hold on. Oh. Solve the problem and we have been able to overcome the U.S. intervention. <laughs> so please go ahead. Yeah, that, that, thanks to the high tech knowledge of this 19-year-old nephew of mine, Diana <laughs> Powers, who is able to, to, to rectify the problem. I thought that David was going to open up and then I would, and I would add my comments on how you want to do it, David. You want me to just go, go straight into a... Yes, no. uh, presentation, and then we can have a discussion later on. Yes, if, if you can. Hi, Don. Good afternoon. Yes, if if you could talk, start off with some of you know the the achievements, accomplishments, some of your own analysis and so on, and then Merle yeah. Mer will follow you, and and I will tag last because of course both you and Merle were living and working right. in, in, in the revolution, and I was looking on from. From outside, so it's best. It's best. Well, more than looking on. <laughs> best you want to go first, and of course, you were both there on October 19th, which was critical. You were not there on March 13th because both 
And I should say that both um, yourself and Merle responded to the call of the revolution for yeah. Caribbean people to, to come into Grenada to work um, as, and, as part of the revolutionary process and contribute to the revolutionary process. So I think it'd be good for you as well to, to go first and then, and then I, will, I will go okay. afterwards if that's okay with you. Yeah? That's fine. And, and if you uh, wish to, to leave the, 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 the discussion before it ends, just let us know and we could release you. Yeah? Okay, so all right. It's, it's, we are, we are, I'll try to hang it with, with you for the whole, the whole team. Here. All right, appreciate it. Uh, yeah, my, my pleasure. Well, good, good afternoon, sisters and brothers. Um, uh, a warm revolutionary greetings to all those who are participating in this afternoon's event in Trinidad. Uh, I, I unfortunately cannot join you. But uh, to the waters of technology, we, we, we are able to connect nonetheless. Uh, a special greeting to my old friends, David Abdullah and Mul Khan, both inestimable comrades, uh, who I have tremendous respect and love for, um, and who worked, we worked together on many occasions during the period of the Grenada Revolution. Uh, I, want to, I, I want to start off, however, Oh, let me back up. I'm not talking about, uh, as David correctly pointed out, on the 13th of March 1979, when the revolution came to power, led by Maurice Bishop and the New Jewel Movement. Uh, I was working in New York at the time. I was a newspaper editor and I also was a radio show host. But I had a previous history with Maurice Bishop Going back to the days when we were teenagers, we went to the same Presentation Brothers College in Grenada. We were on the tennis teams together. Our parents knew each other well. My father and his father were good friends. So we had a relationship going, going quite a ways back to the days when I grew up in Grenada. But I landed in Grenada in 1979 at the invitation of Maurice to come back and help build a um, a media infrastructure for the revolution. And I landed in Grenada. It was in October of nineteen seventy nine, which was I was I was thirty years old. I was a young man at the time. Well here we are, forty years later, we are talking still talking about the Grenada Revolution and what it meant to the Caribbean region because it was truly a seminal historical event and I applaud David Abdullah and the party for lifting up the memory of the Grenada Revolution when you could be doing a million other things on a Saturday afternoon. But uh, I applaud you for that because uh, keeping the memory of the Grenada Revolution is alive is very important for current generations of young Caribbean people who know very little about, about this seminal chapter in the history of our region. Um, Grenada was, uh, what happened in Grenada 40 years ago, the trial of the revolution, and it's um, very regrettable and very unfortunate demise four, four years later, uh, in October of 1983, when uh, Maurice and uh, a number of other comrades, some of them the leaders, of the government, others leaders of the New Jewel Movement were brutally assassinated uh, in Benin uh, after the masses had released Bishop from jail. Uh, I don't have the time nor the energy to relitigate the deeply and unfortunate uh, political differences that arose within the ruling New Jewel Movement that led to um, the tragedies of Bishop's death and the death of others, and followed by the natural country that shut down the entire country, followed by U.S. invasion, etc., and the ultimate demise of the Grenada Revolution. I'm not going to go into all of those details. We don't have we don't have time for that on this this afternoon's discussion. However, I would say that with regard to what happened on. Uh, October 1983, when Lucia died, uh, as a result of serious crimes that were committed 
They are those who are using this opportunity to try to revisit or revise. Yeah, there's, there's a revisionist history going on right now in, in various parts of the world that are trying to revise some of the basic facts that took place uh, in Grenada during the first half of the days. Uh, but all I can say is that they, for those people who are trying to apologize or explain it away, uh, the death of Bishop and, and the others uh, who, who died with him that day, all the other martyrs of the Great Revolution who died that day, who were wounded, uh, and there are many, and that history ha has not been fully written. By the way, there is no existing uh, memorial, uh, any, any physical memorial outside of the, the airport, or Bishop National Airport. Uh, that bears the memory of, of, of Bishop and the Revolution. There's no, there, there is a formal educational initiative underway in Grenada at, at, at this time, or anywhere in the Caribbean for that matter, that, that, that teaches the current generation what it is that happened in Grenada 40 years ago. Uh, this very important chapter in, in the history of the Caribbean. Uh, so, I would say that to those who say, oh yes, we made mistakes and we made errors uh, in, in, in Bishop's death and so on, I maintain that these were not errors. I maintain that they were premeditated acts of terror against the Canadian people. Uh, and I maintain that, I maintain that uh, they were crimes against humanity. But that is how but those responsible internally for the collapse of the Grenada Revolution have to come to terms with his history. History will prove that I am correct. I say that with all confidence. Uh, for me and my family personally, this was a life-changing experience, living and working in Grenada uh, for four years. It was a, was, was a life-changing, transformative experience for me and my family. Um, when we left New York, uh, we had, we left New York back in 1983, uh, uh, sorry, back in 1979, with the view that we would settle down in Grenada and raise our family in Grenada, and that, and that didn't work out. But, however, the experience for me and my family was very exciting. It, 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 participating on a day-to-day -day level in the Grenada revolutionary process was extremely stimulating, intellectually, spiritually, and otherwise. And uh, I, w I wish I had the words to communicate, particularly to the younger people, how motivated we were. Uh, not just me and my family, but so many people of our generation who came to Grenada during the 40 years, I mean, during the uh, four years of revolution to work, to contribute, to participate in a process of building a, a truly independent country, right, by virtue of a grassroots effort to involve masses of Canadians in the process of building the, their own society, building a new democracy, a popular participatory democracy did not exist uh, before the revolution came to power. To involve the masses of the of Canadian people in every aspect of their economic, social, political development. Um, so it was truly a popular revolution in the sense that it was driven by the people, by the energy, the creativity of the Canadian people, and, so, and that energy and creativity uh, was also uh, contributed to by many Caribbean people who, who, who traveled from all over the region, including the French-speaking Caribbean, to, uh, to either visit Grenada, see what was going on there, or even spend time working on the region. So, you know, if you're looking for something to motivate you at this particular time, uh, getting involved in a, in, in, a, in a social change experiment like what the revolution was uh, would, would certainly um, address those, those anxieties.
But uh, the revolution achieved a tremendous uh, amount in, in a very concrete way in terms of governance, in terms of economic management and development. Uh, you had a, a period of time when we for three consecutive years, gross domestic product of the Canadian economy grew by 5%. Um, I have to give credit to, to the man who I have uh, uh, been very critical of over the years, uh, Bernard Ford, Deputy Prime Minister, who I, I think uh, bears the ultimate moral responsibility for the crisis of October 1983. Um, he was a, is a brilliant uh, economist and was uh, uh, a political economist. And it is under his guidance that the Canadian economy uh, grew very impressively uh, during during those four short years. Uh, in in the area of um, educational development, where Sister Conrad Bull will speak to that because she was she was intimately involved in that process of uh, building institutions of popular education in, throughout throughout the country helping to, to uh, reduce the level of illiteracy, bringing educational programs into the rural parts of the country, uh, all of which she was involved in when she worked with uh, the Minister of Education, Kamar Jackie, yeah, who was also one of those martyrs that was killed, it was executed at Fort um, we, we We have to lift up and remember the contribution that she, has, that she made uh, when she was alive to the revolution. Um, yes, and, and in the area of uh, medicine, uh, you know, with the help of, of Cuban doctors, Cuban international doctors, we were able to bring substantial improvements to public, public health and public health delivery systems throughout the country. Uh, in, 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 in the area of sports, we did a tremendous progress during the revolution. Uh, and all those levels. In the area of culture, cultural expression, uh, um, in the form of uh, Kaiso, revolutionary Kaiso, revolutionary uh, sounds that percolated throughout the Caribbean region. Um, the young, artistic, creative of, of the Grenadian people uh, produced those kinds of um, results. So Grenada was an exciting place to live and to work and to and to feel that you were truly involved in something historic, something that would change the Caribbean civilization uh, for a long time, it had a huge impact, positive impact, um, and it did. There were literally hundreds of Caribbean people who came to Grenada, worked to volunteer, etc., to make contributions to what they saw as a revolutionary process that was um, that was beyond the tiny island of Grenada, that it had a significance that was uh, that transcended the region and indeed the world. Um, yeah, so there were. Uh, they, I want to also lift up the parish council uh, and the zonal and parish council process that was established. Uh, the idea was that to get the mass organizations women's groups, the youth groups, groups of professionals, the workers, get them all involved in uh, city councils, get get uh, their representatives involved in, in determining with the PRG what were the best policies for developing uh, their communities, their villages, etc. They involving them, involving representatives of the mass organizations in planning the economy and hold up. Planning yeah, economic development was a truly uh, a revolutionary act and a, true, and a truly democratic act. It was a, it was uh, it was inspiring, and and they responded. The Grenadian masses responded very very well to uh, to this particular initiative. Uh, even planning the national budget, we were involved in making contributions to planning the. Um, a government driven but people doors that people supported people involved economic uh, planning and uh, budgeting process so that that was
extremely significant, and I, I wanted to make sure to lift that up uh, in this in this short presentation. So, I mean, I can go on, David, for a long time. We, we had, um, uh, you know, Grenada did did achieve uh, not all by itself. We also enjoyed the solidarity of uh, uh, of many countries around the world, principally revolutionary Cuba. I have to admit that there is no other country in the Caribbean that uh, is as stellar in its concrete solidarity, its revolutionary solidarity, as, as has been Cuba and continues to be. So it is our, I think it is, it, it, for all of us, we have to um, go on a step. Yeah, to, um, to remember that and to appreciate what our Cuban comrades, sisters and brothers in Cuba have done for us over in terms of their solidarity with Grenada, but also ongoing solidarity throughout the region. Uh, and that's a reflection of, of who they really are, how principled revolutionary people they are. Uh, and uh, that's, again, another reason why uh, uh, Maurice Bishop paid such a half stake in developing a close relationship with, um, with uh, Fidel Castro and Cuban leadership from the very early day in the very first yet revolution. Uh, uh, the first active diplomatic outreach of the revolution was, was with Cuba. And that uh, proved to be tremendously to, the, to, to achieve the same economic development that I just mentioned, five percent. You know, because we got aid from Cuba in a range of industries, agribusiness, fisheries, uh, and of course, principally the building of the international airport, the movie special international airport. But Cuba sent to Grenada during those four years hundreds of workers, hundreds. <laughs> you know, just this one country in the Caribbean, they sent, they sent engineers, they sent, um, scientists, doctors, nurses, working in the hospitals, going into all the villages, making house calls to, to, to the poorest people in villages all over the country. All right, so these are Cuban internationalists and Cuban solidarity workers have to, uh, to, to, to catapult Grenada during those four years. So we have to lift, lift up by the region that, uh, that Cuba is a Caribbean country, and they take their, their regional identification very seriously. Um, um, so anyway, they, with, with the Cuban help, a lot was achieved economically, socially, politically, during, during the times of the revolution. And um, I, I, I think the time has come now, you know, uh, to 40 years, for there to be a serious, effort made to begin at the level of the existing Grenada government to begin some kinds of programs in the schools or even some public education programs that uh, have to teach the current Grenadian generation something about that four-year period of their modern history that was so seminal, so significant to them and to the entire region. This, this idea of turn blind eye or straight just lip service to Maurice, my current government of Grenada is not going to cut it. You know, uh, pressure has to be brought to bear from them, something more. Uh, I know Maurice's daughter, uh, Nadia, who is herself a trained lawyer and attorney based in, in the advice, has been waging a violent struggle for years, trying to get Grenada government to hand over Maurice Bishop's remains to the, to the Bishop family. They, they've asked the Americans to do that for the Americans. The Canadians say the Americans have their uh, So that she and the family could give him a decent burial somewhere in, in Grenada. That is, that is yet to happen. It's a shame. After year. Um, but yeah, it, is a, it does bring back um, it does bring back a lot of nostalgic memories uh, for me and uh, to my family. Uh, we consider Grenada uh, you know, 40 years later. Uh, I think historians will, uh, will, will still have to 
there's still a lot of work to do. There's still a lot of analytical work to do in terms of uh, ideological arguments that arose within the party uh, that led to to the demise of Prabhu uh, Therein contain many, many lessons for us today, those of us who are still involved in social change work and in political reform. So, as I'm sure some many of many of you listening to this broadcast today are involved in that kind of work. Lots of important lessons to be learned uh, from what happened in Grenada. So David, if you, with your indulgence, I will pause for a minute. Yes, sir. Before I give it back to, to Ozzy, who's the moderator, I think I, Don would be, it's okay if I say this, that we deeply appreciate Don being with us by Skype this afternoon because he's actually having a tremendous battle of his own personally fighting cancer right now. Um, and there's, there's a GoFund, which I'll talk about afterwards, and we'll talk about it when Don is online. Um, so Don, you know, we, we really appreciate your making the, the physical and emotional effort to, to speak about the Grenadian Revolution. Um, well, and, and, I had to, I had to, I had to do it. So let's, let's, let's hear another round of applause. Thank you very much. I, I should just indicate before I hand over to Ozzy, since I have the mic, that um, the Cuban ambassador to Trinidad and Tobago is here, so she heard you. Um, it's the first female ambassador from Cuba to Trinidad and Tobago, and she only a week ago um, was able to present her credentials, so she's officially now the ambassador, Her Excellency Tanya Diego Olite. So um, she heard of all your comments, and I'm sure she appreciated that as well. And, uh, Thank you. Pleasure to meet you, uh, Commerce Sister uh, Ambassador. And please uh, uh, feel free to ask my unqualified solidarity with your government and with your revolution. Yeah. And I, I, little, little later on, I'll tell you that I did spend three years, I've got 40 years, I spent three years living in, in Havana, Cuba. This was in the 1980s, some of the most pleasant times that, we have, that, that my family and I have enjoyed. So if we have time, we can talk a little bit. We can talk about that. I remember visiting you at your apartment there. All right. Uh -huh. And, and um, Ed Two Springer joined us a while ago. You remember, Don, in August of 1983, uh, we were having a planning meeting for the second intellectuals for the sovereignty of the Caribbean, which was chaired by, by Commodore George Lamy. And right. we were meeting down at the hotel, and, and Ed Two was there with Earl Lovelace and yourself and so on in that right. planning meeting. So Ed Two has joined us while he was speaking. Oh, nice. Hey, comrade. <laughs> okay, so what are we going to do? Um, Don, we we'll keep you on the computer. We we'll probably turn it around a little bit so you can actually see the audience, or actually to see whoever is speaking. We we'll move, we we'll shift the laptop accordingly so that you really feel you're part of the of the session. Okay? All right, sounds good. All right, great. Thank you. Um, one of the things that struck me, um, Don, is is when you said that you were 30 years old right. when you went to to join in building a, a, a new Grenada, a new Caribbean civilization. And we do have some young people in our audience here. Um, so I think it's just very inspirational to hear how you at that age of 30, you know, decided to make a solid contribution to transforming not just Grenada, but really transforming the Caribbean civilization. So I think that that is, says a lot for, for those of us. But I'm, I'm a little past 30. Um, <laughs> yeah, just a little. Uh, past 30, but there are those uh, in the audience here who would hear that message. And just to let you know, we are also taping, so that's, this entire session would be on YouTube, uh, because it's important, of course, to use the technology to spread yes. information. So we will also have it on YouTube, which we'll send to you, and you can also spread it around, and we'll send it to many of the different youth councils and so on throughout the Caribbean. We're really going to use this as a catalyst to maybe spark something something um, powerful okay, going forward. Be happy to help. Okay, now we have with us, as I said, a national icon, um, Comrade Merle Hodge, I, I like to call her Comrade. And I've been, and the, the feminists, has, they have boofed me many times when I used to say Sister Comrade. It's like, what is Sister Comrade? What is that? So I have learned my lesson. So Comrade Merle, who would have been, who would have joined uh, others like Don 
as I said, not just to transform Grenada, but really transform the Caribbean civilization. So we are going to hear from her, um, her own thoughts and feelings and analysis of that historic moment in Caribbean, I would even say in world history, that of the Grenadian Revolution. Please join me in welcoming Comrade Mulhaj. Cuban ambassador, right? Um, welcome to Trinidad and Tobago. And, and I just want to, to let people know that, um, well, just to let people know the, the, the kind of cooperation. I was in education, I was in a teacher education program and producing materials. And I, I had the, 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 um, the, the job of um, getting together with other people, a new set of readers that we named the Marichal readers, step by step. We, we, um, we got teachers to help us know what the interests of the children were. The teachers um, helped to give um, ideas for stories in the, 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 the readers and so. And the, this was the, these readers, as far as we got, were printed at this point later. But let me just read this because it is relevant to this whole process. The evolution of structures to ensure people's participation was a major concern of the NGM from its inception. The party organization before the revolution comprised a network of cells all over the country which sent elected representatives to a central assembly called the National Coordinating Council of Delegates. The party network also included the NJM NYO, which are the National Youth Organization, which is, sorry, the, the NJM's National Youth Organization, formed shortly after the birth of the NJM in 1973. The NJM the NWO, which is a, a second um, arm of the, the NGM the, the, from before the revolution, National Women's Organization, which was formed in 1977, and NGM Party Support Groups. All of these things are before the revolution, and I can assure you that after the revolution, these things did not remain party groups. These, these were thrown over to everybody in, in the country, anybody who wanted to be part. About nine months before the revolution, the party had moved to institute parish councils, in which members of these various organizations met to discuss problems facing the people of the parish, as well as broad national issues. These meetings, like much of the organizing activity of the NJM, were clandestine. When the party came to power in 1979, all of these structures moved on to the public plane. And now, I, I myself had the privilege of taking part as a villager of St. Paul's, Grenada, in the further evolution of this system of democracy in the meeting. Once a month, our, our women's group, our NWO group, National Women's Organization group, um, would, would put, put it together, put up you know, our money and hire a maxi and proceed with great excitement to, um, to this meeting which was called Parish Council. People from all parts of, of the parish would converge there to give their views on the progress of the country in general and to bring up problems in their community. Or to report back on solutions that had been um, brought to bear arising out of the, 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 the previous um, parish council. People looked forward to this assembly because it was, you know, what the, it was continuing that tradition of assemblies that the NJ had, NJM had started. And we just thoroughly enjoyed the, this, this whole thing. Thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. After a few months, what happened was that the parish councils had grown so large, the standing room only, because people just flowed in. The people really loved that, you know. Um, they, they have grown so large that, that these councils had to be broken up into village councils. Members of the leadership and technical people from various ministries were always in attendance. The development of an actual system of governance which, which, would, which, well, which, which was supposed to have become official or would have become official if the, in, if the revolution had not been shut down. Um, was was um, only a part of the, the work in progress. All the while that those things were being done, you know, developing village council and, and parish council and all of that. While that work was being done to con um, other work was being done to create the conditions in which a truly participatory democracy democracy could grow and flourish. And um, this this was that uh, you know to this end creating participatory democracy. Um, the following approaches became national policy and were actually being carried out. Maintaining contact between leadership and people, encouraging public discussion of national issues, 
expanding education based on the principle that without education, people cannot fully participate in the running of their country. That, that is the hypocrisy. The people who are illiterate at the last election shouldn't be illiterate at the next election because they, 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 you know, that limits their, their, their ability to, to participate. So that the Center for Public, Popular Education, called CPE, was a program operated all over the country to tackle the high rate of illiteracy in the world. Um, and there were, you know, these classes were taught by volunteers, among them many school children taught older people to, to read and read. High school places were increased by the building of new schools and high school fees were abolished. Provision for tertiary education increased from a one-digit number of students to a three-digit figure because Revolutionary Grenada attracted so many scholarships, notably from Cuba, of course, right? Many, many, many scholarships. But we, we, we attracted scholarship, um, scholarships from far and wide. And what also made a difference was that Grenada, which had you know, lapsed in paying, paying up its um, fees, its contribution to UE, or the, the regional um, university, was, you know, that was, um, was paid up, or we began to pay up, the, you know, so, so that Grenadian students were once more, could come to the university as um, financial members. All right, um, sorry, where am I? Okay, I, this specific program that I, um, I took the part in was NISTEP, the National in Service Teacher Education Program. And just to, 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 to speak about that in a, a nut, nutshell, as my father used to say, a nutmeg, which would be a, a very um, apt you know, image for <laughs> <laughs> yes. okay. you. Uh, there was a very small percentage of teachers who were trained. What used to happen is that there was a teacher, there was probably still is a, a teacher's college, where you would train one class and one class would graduate. And in that same year, that same number of students would, would go to the states because I mean, there wasn't much motivation for you know people with, with certain levels of education to, to stay in Grenada, right? Um, so that what what was done was that we 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 decided to have classes one day a week for for, for all the, the the untrained teachers who who were the majority, um, but the, the trained teachers would stay in the in the, the school on that day. Um, and they would they would sort of coordinate or be there to, to support a, another program called CSDP, Community School Day Program. On the day that the teachers left the school to go to their center for, for, for training, um, this the CSDP got, got people in the community to come in to help the remaining teachers. And they, of course, couldn't teach what the good teacher was teaching, those who could did. But they would teach them things like, you know, um, carpentry, cooking, read to them anything that, any skill that you have, anything that you could do to, to help look after children. On a day when their teacher was not there, people came in and, and did, did that. Then we had three centers, one in the north, one in, one in St. George's, and one in Kariakou. Um, another approach was the fostering of group activity, the habit of association. Um, the atmosphere of the revolution stimulated the form formation of countless new groups and the revival of groups which had become defunct. And then, of course, as part of its economic policy, the government pursued the creation of a cooperative sector. And I'm just going to once more quote from somebody here. This is a Trinidadian who, like me and like Don and like many others, packed up, you know, family, child, belongings, and went. Um, this is Regina Dumas, and I'm going to mention the name of her book afterwards in the list. Um, where is the start? Okay, she, she, she is the person who ran um, an institution created especially for the purpose of um, developing and encouraging cooperatives, the National Development Agency, NACDA. All right? Um, so she, she gives a little um, description of it here. Noting the twin problems of joblessness and landlessness among the youth sectors of the society, the PRG had created a program designed to respond to these two key problems, the National Cooperative, the National Cooperative Development Agency, NACDA, with its slogan, Idle Lands for Idle Hands. Right? And this, this program was instituted with, with me, which is Regina, as the director of the, of the, the, the program. Yes, and she did an, an amazing job. Um, 
Okay, I'm almost done. This is it. This, this, this is really almost the end. Um, okay. Well, I forget where I left off. Yeah. So, so yes, well, I got the last thing I talked there about was, was cooperatives, which became a part of the, the economic policy and, of course, also carried out the objective of um, nurturing the habit of acting together, with, you know, collective action, cooperation. Now it is impossible to present here a full picture of what was achieved in the Green Aid Revolution. You, you really need to, to, well, to see some of the books that I, I, I have um, listed here. There are, there are many more. There's just too much to tell. The revolution was written about while it was taking place by a number of people who either visited or were there for the whole duration. They wrote books, articles, printed speeches, chapters in books. And these, these are just a few of them. There, there were people who wrote books after the revolution, well, they published them after the revolution. Some people who wrote it, you know, looking back. But they will have been there and will have and had the experience. Um, now, the, the most re recent one that I know about, actually, is Re Regina's book. And it's a, a, a substantial chapter in the autobiography of, of this woman, an old friend of mine, Regina Dumas. Um, you know, who, who went to, to Vineda with her children. Um, her book is called Memoirs of a, a Cocoa Farmer, the Farmer's Daughter. And a large chunk of the book is a chapter called Grenada and My Experience of the Grenada Revolution. And that, that's a book I just read from. There was also, um, there are also two, early, two well, one, one early publication was the book Grenada, the Peaceful Revolution by the EPICA Task Force. Now, EPICA is the acronym for an organization based in the US called the Ecumenical Program for Inter-American Communication and Action. That was published in 1982. And there's another EPICA book authored by Catherine Sunshine, published in 1985. That one is called The Caribbean Survival, Struggle, and Sovereignty. Um, these two books give a very positive and balanced portrait of the revolution. And the, the books are enriched and enlivened by photographs and interviews with actual Grenadians at the time of the revolution. Um, then there's, there's this book that was put together after the revolution called A Caribbean Reader on Development. Well, I'm not going to come to the date now, but um, you know, it, um, it, it can, it's a collection of um, of essays. It isn't all about Grenada, but Grenada features in a number of them. Um, but it's, it's the, the topic of, of an article that, that I contributed. And it, the, uh, the, the artic, article, the chapter, is called Towards People's Particip Participation in Caribbean Development. Right? There, there are chapters like, well, Carl Stone also did something on Jamaica and, and Grenada. Um, and, and I myself, co-authored with um, Chris Searle, who is another one who, he's from England, he's from Britain, he's a, a teacher in Britain. He packed up wife, children, a whole gang of children. Um, they, 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 they were from, his wife and children, wife was from Canada too, and came. You know, um, so um, so he, was in, he worked in this step as well. Um, and he, the, the book that we Co-author is called is Freedom Be Making, right? Um, and you know, so to, to, to just close off, quite a lot of documentation was produced, but much of it is out of print, so that whoever can take on the task of searching out and collecting these publications and having them republished and disseminating will be doing a great service to the current and future generations of the Caribbean, so, so that they can have a clear picture of what really went on there. Right and how really powerful it was. The progressive movement owes it to itself, as and I don't need this the same point. I was was happy to, to hear him make the point. The progressive movement owes it to itself to pass on the information to the younger generation and to the politicians. Right. So so that if you if we, we could get these these books going again, we will we will give complimentary copies to the politicians as part of our, of our continuing fight. For the, the, you know, and the, and this this will this will will tr tremendously support and give inspiration to our continuing fight for the right. freedom to build as we see fit and again and in peace as we see fit and in peace. I have to, to stress okay. our own models of development. 
Thank you for inviting me to this. I forgot to say that. And and um, kudos to, to David and the, the MSJ for doing this. You see, it's very, very important. Indeed. Thank you, sister. Well, watch another round of You mentioned, I mean, quite a lot that yes. was important. I mean, the thing is that we've captured it, um, so we will be able to share so much of what you said this afternoon. And one of the things that struck me is when you talked about how people remember the Grenada Revolution, either as a coup d'etat, a bloodless coup, or they remember the end result, the blood of the end, the tragedy at the end. But what you shared with us is what happened in between that. To me, that is the most important thing about remembering the Grenada Revolution. What happened in between there? That struggle, as you said, for a just society, the question of um, a period of positive development, and you gave very concrete examples in terms of education, the economy, the question of popular democracy, uh, popular participation of people, uh, literally shaping their own destiny. And that was so, so critical. Um, and of course, you talk about making social justice a reality. And I would have put Don also mentioned the whole question of social justice. So what we have here with us, the political leader of the movement for social justice. Um, but let me uh, just recognize um, our first vice president of the well, first vice president of the Oddfield Workers Trade Union, himself a Grenadian, uh, proud one at that. Uh, maybe during the um, the exchange with the participants, he'd probably share his experience in terms of the Grenada Revolution. And I see that our national icon, Pearl, has rejoined us, so we will also hear a few you know, words from her a little later on. Um, so we're looking forward. So it'll be a really rich afternoon, and then of course it's an open discussion, so anyone can share their own thoughts. But for now, please join me to bring on um, Comrade David Abdullah, political leader of the Movement for Social Justice. You and Merle going first was the best um, batting order for this yeah. afternoon's discussion yeah. because yeah. it was important for, for, for everyone, first of all those of us who are older and a number of older ones here in the audience as well, to, to remember because often we forget as well a lot of the details um, and, and the details that Merle provided were very, very important because I had forgotten some of those details myself. Um, and, and to understand therefore the, the real content of the Grenadian Revolution and why it was so important for all of us. Um, and and I, I will never forget the discussion a couple of days before the 19th of October um, that um, George Weeks had. We had. I placed a call. We actually, the, at that time, we had the political organization, the Committee for Labor Solidarity. So the entire um, leadership of, of the CLS, including um, Alan Alexander, Lennox Speer, George Weeks, Rafiq Shah, Aaron McLeod, Teddy Belgrave, Lyle Townsend, and so on. We gathered at, at Cecil Paul's house, actually, um, in Sawan, and we placed, I placed a call to Bernard's house. Um, Morris was under house arrest, um, and Selwyn Strong answered the phone, and um, I asked if, if Bernard would come to the phone, he said no. And George Weeks then, um, spoke to Selwyn, pleaded first of all to speak to Bernard, but um, Selwyn refused to allow Bernard to, to come to the phone, or said Bernard was not there or not prepared to come to the phone, though the call went directly to Bernard Court's home. And George begged, you know, and, and this is George Weeks, who was the elder, if you wish, because of this, of, of, of 1970, um, and, and the struggles of the Union in the 60s and so on. And therefore, George was 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 an elder to Boris and to everyone else yes. in the yes. revolution. And the OWTU itself had contributed in various ways, both before and after, um, to the Grenadian Revolution. So, George begged and pleaded, um, first of all, that that no harm should come to anyone, and and had said that that he and Rafik and others were prepared to come in as mediators. Um, to try to, 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 to resolve that, that internal conflict that had, that had developed and had become very, very antagonistic and, and as it turned out, was going to be violent, but we sensed it was heading in that direction. 
and, and strong business said it was a Sunday afternoon, so it was Morris was killed on a Tuesday, the 19th was a Tuesday, if my memory serves me right. So this must have been um, the, the Tuesday, the 18th, the 17th. And, and Selwyn basically said, um, Strong said, um, Morris went too far, etc., etc., etc. And H.A. will be making a statement, so listen to the radio later tonight. Um, and, and that was the response to to to, to Comrade Leakes's uh, on behalf of many other persons um, pleading for for that intervention. So I, I, I just thought I'd, I'd mention that and then make the point that that the what George had said is that not only would if if this if that conflict had not was not resolved peacefully and in unity, then it would set back not just the Grenadian Revolution but set back the entire progressive movement in the Caribbean. That, that was that was the point that, that John was making because the Grenadian Revolution was so important, um, both psychologically for for Caribbean people, as both Don and Bird have said, people went there and were enthusiastic and excited. That, but the slogan that emerged many decades afterwards by the social movements that another world is possible, um, that idea was made reality during the period of the Grenadian Revolution. That we could have. <coughs> a very small island in the Caribbean um, engaged in a type of development which was challenging the traditional political and economic and social relations that had been established in the period of colonialism and which were reinforced post-independence by, 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 by a, 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 a state that was really a neo-colonial state and with all of the economic relations being remaining the traditional plantation economic relations. Um, and Grenada was saying that, that there was another way um, and was therefore offering a, a, a lot of hope to people in the Caribbean. And that was what George was, was saying, that, that if, if you allow this thing to, to, to deteriorate any further, then that hope would be destroyed or set back for many, many generations. And I have no doubt in my own mind that the way in which the Grenadian Revolution ended, um, and prior to that, the assassination of Walter Rodney um, in 1980, that those two events were critical to the, to the, to the reversing and the weakening of the progressive movements right throughout the region. But we don't have time to go into that now. I've written about that and spoken about that elsewhere. Let me just say that what, in terms of lessons, because I, I really wanted us to identify some lessons coming out of the Grenada Revolution experience. One was, for us, how do we go about this challenge of bringing about fundamental change in the economic, social, and political relations of power? How do we create a participatory democracy that Merle was speaking about with the parish councils and a budgetary process where where people gathered in the in the dome on Grand Anse. The dome, for those who don't know, was was the Grenadian equivalent of our Queen's Hall, right? Um, not that as sophisticated as Queen's Hall, but it was the equivalent. The cultural center in Grand Anse, um, and, and people gathered in the dome for all kinds of activities, cultural activities and so on, but, but also to discuss the budget. So it wasn't like the, we having the Minister of Finance dropping the budget on budget day and nobody knows what the budget is going to say and there's no accountability after that and so on and so on. It was a participatory process. So so how do you create a participatory political process um, of democracy? How do you change the economic relations of power so that you don't have, for example, um, at TSTT, the CEO getting $200,000 a month um, at the same time that almost 700 people are, are retrenched and so on. And, and that's just an example of our state enterprise. I did not address the issue of, of when I heard Christian Boutet on television last night <coughs> speaking about, or night before, at the opening of, of the new um, mini food mall in Trin City uh, by the roundabout. And he talked about promoting our brands and, and, and what he was, all the brands are Christian Boutet's prestige holdings, which is KFC, Starbucks, uh, Pizza Hut, TGIF, which are American brands, but he was saying our brands, 
and, 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 and so how do we break that type of economic relationship of power um, where we are even more deeply integrated now into Western capitalist economy, the US consumer economy that, that we were in the 70s. Yes, and Gregory Maguire is here and he will tell you the struggles he has trying to sell his, his rum liqueur, right? In competition to babies and all the other liqueurs and the, the power relations that the supermarkets have that wouldn't allow that to be sold in the supermarkets but, but, but uh, you know, promoting the foreign brands and so on and so on. So it is at so many different levels, um, cultural, um, the social relations of violence, which have become so much worse um, now in our society than they were in 1979, and so on, um, and, and relation, power relations between men and women, between adults and children, and so many other things that have to be transformed. So, so the question arises: How do we how do we challenge that status quo and transform the status quo into a society? as the, the principles of, of the NGM had said in 79, a society that is more equitable and, and where there is social justice and peace and so on. And, and when we, so when, when of course we can't answer that question now, obviously some of us have some ideas, but that remains centrally the challenge for progressive movements. Um, it, was, it was begun to be achieved in Grenada um, between 79 and 83, um, but it hasn't happened anywhere else in the English-speaking Caribbean whatsoever. So that, that's a challenge that remains, um, and, and we have to continue to work towards that. A weakness in my view was the fact that, and it was given time it would have been done, because Alan Alexander, who passed away three years ago, I think it was, two, three years ago, um, senior counsel, Alan, close friend, personal friend of, of Morris, but also politically um, you know, very close to Morris and, and the Grenadian Revolution for many years, his mother being Grenadian and, and Alan being an attorney together with, with Morris and another then young attorney, one Bobby Clark, whose daughter is here with us, and Richard Small from Jamaica and Miles Fitzpatrick from, from Guyana were a core of young progressive lawyers who fought social justice issues, human rights issues, workers' rights issues, rights of the Caribbean. Um, and I know that Bobby, Bobby had gone into Grenada just after the revolution, of course, because of their relationship with politically and personally with Morris and so on. I was there, you know, in a semi-attorney general position, even though there was no formal thing after the revolution like that for the line. Um, but Alan went in, was asked by Morris and the PRG sometime in 83 to be the, if I'm not mistaken, the sole um, constitution reform commissioner. Um, but that process never got off the ground. And, and to me, that was one of the critical things that, that would, would have ensured the continuity of the revolution had it, been, had it happened, because it would have institutionalized the relationships between the cabinet and the parish councils and a whole series of things like that, and therefore institutionalized in a constitutional and legal way the, the, the popular um, power um, structures and so on. Um, and we had in the CLS at the time, because, because Alan was a member of the of of steering committee of the CLS, we had major discussions about that. Um, and, and I remember it was Lennox Spear, another lawyer, and a Marxist and so on, who was one of the most important people in this country um, and whose memory we have to, to keep alive as well. Lennox said to Alan, and in our discussions, Lennox said, you, we have to work out, we have to work out how we make people sovereign because it can't be that the parliament is sovereign, that's the, the Westminster notion that parliament is sovereign and so on. How do we make the people sovereign? And, and, and Lennox was talking therefore about a, 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 a parliamentary or two houses of parliament, one being the, 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 um, where the people would have direct representation in a quote-unquote Senate type arrangement 
Um, and, and he said, that is how the dictatorship of the people is. They say proletariat, they change for the people, have to be expressed. So Lennox was, was using his Marxist analysis to try to, to develop, in the context of our Caribbean <coughs> culture and experience and so on, how, how people's power could be, could be entrenched. And I never forget the discussion in, at the ODB2 headquarters in July of, of 83, because it was CARICOM heads of government met in China and they were in July of 83. So Morris came and the ODB2 hosted a, a reception for him. It was really supposed I was, to I was there today, but I remember that. You were there. there, okay. I was there on that occasion, yes. <laughs> right. And, and it was supposed to be for Grenadian members of the ODB2. Right. Right? And of course, executive members and branch officers, general council officers. And so the, the middle floor of Paramount, we were expecting about 300 people, but we about 700 people show up. Everybody claimed to be Grenadian that day. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was crazy. But it was a very powerful, Morris spoke at length at Paramount building, and then we went upstairs to the, to the, to the conference room upstairs. And Lennox said to, to Morris, never forget that exchange, Lennox, because all part of the issue of democracy and so on. Lennox said, Morris, Morris, and, and, and so they also speaking both as a lawyer, one of the foremost constitutional lawyers of Trinidad and Tobago, and as a Marxist coming out of the 40s and 50s and so on, and as a cultural person, because then Oxpear was a person who started TASPO, and, and who was working with, yes, yeah, yeah, he, yeah the TASPO used to, to practice down at, at um, where Paragon is now, where the, where the Trinidad Youth Council had its, um, it's, it's, it's headquarters and Lennox and his wife, Dolly, were, were the, were the um, wardens of the Trinidad Youth Council. And the Trinidad Youth Council organized re lecture recitals by Edric Connor and, and a whole range of things. But anyways, I digress. So Lennox said, Lennox said to, to Boris, Boris, you can't have socialism in Grenada because the working class of Grenada resides in the oil fields of Trinidad. <laughs> <laughs> a, very, a very important and profound political statement because the only groups of, of, of workers in the industrial sense in Grenada was Coca-Cola factory, the docks I suppose, and, and the small number of electricity workers and, and, and so on. There were, there were no other industrial workers of that, there was no proletariat in that sense. Right, 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 right. With all due respects to our comrades and friends from the other Caribbean countries, you cannot gain say that the relationship between Grenada and Trinidad fits into a very special category uh, uh, for the reasons you just mentioned. And that continues up to today. Yes. You know, that continues up to today. So, so this is, what, what you're doing today is so critical to join also the links between the two countries, the two cultures, etc. But sorry to interrupt you. No, no, that's not for that, yeah. So, so that issue of, was I think a weakness um, that, that existed. The, the last one I want to make is about, um, about the, the ideological and political tendencies that went into the formation of the New Jewel Movement. Because Morris had before the New Jewel Movement his own political organization, which was the Movement for the Assemblies of the People. And a lot of those principles that Merle read out in terms of participatory process, Assemblies of the People, and so on, came, my understanding, and I'm, I'm saying this not first hand, I'm saying this from my own assessment, came from Morris's <coughs> own political um, tradition, if you wish, of Movement for the Assemblies of the People. Which, which would have been influenced, I think, by people like, and I'm guessing here now a bit, people like Tim Hector and others. Tim, of course, having been very close to C.N.R. James, and therefore that notion of, of every cook can govern, and people's yes. power from below, and the yes. self-organization of people was a very important um, element of, of Morris's ideological position from the movement of the Assemblies of the People. The other element, the other key um, force that, that created the New Jewel Movement was Unison Whiteman, who was also assassinated, murdered on October 19th, up at the fall. He was Minister of Foreign Affairs at the time. Um, and Unison Whiteman had his political organization, which was a joint endeavor for the welfare 
uh, education for liberation, I, 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 right? Which was Jewish, right? The acronym being Jewish. Uh, but it, never, it was a joint endeavor for, I believe, for welfare, education, right. liberation, yes? So Jewel and Movement for the Assembly the Peoples joined to form the new Jewel Movement. Now, somewhere in that context, because Bernard was in Trinidad at UE, lecturing on international relations, and I remember organizing, I was president of the Gale, if I'm not mistaken, of protests and so on, when his work permit was not renewed, and he then left Trinidad and went to Jamaica because his wife Phyllis was being Jamaican, got a part-time job at Mona, and myself and Brian Meeks had gone to Jamaica for university meetings, being president of the Gill, representing the Gill. And myself and Brian Meeks took Bernard Cole to meet with Trevor Monroe. Okay? So my and my understanding from 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 talking to John LaRose, who knew Bernard in England because New Beacon Books published Bernard's book about the, how the British education system made West Indian children um, yes, academically subnormal. Yes, but I did an important piece of research on that, which you which can publish. And, and John was very clear that in the UK, and our understanding of Bernard when we interacted with him at UB was that Bernard was not then a Marxist. Okay? And that developed when he was in Jamaica sometime around 1974, 75. So, during the, during, so within the new jewel then, you had a third element, which, which was Aurel, which was Cord's organization, which was the Organization for Revolutionary Education for Liberation, I think, yes? And that was Cord's faction within the, within, the, within the new jewel movement. And there were, I want to suggest therefore that there were different ideological and political trends that, that were within the Jewel, which eventually emerged in conflict in 83, but, but we don't have time to discuss, discuss all of that. And just to, just to say that um, I agree 100% with Merle that March 13, 1979 was the result of the repression because there was Bloody Sunday, yes? 1973, was it? When or 74, when people, Boris and they had, had a, a peaceful demonstration, um, if I'm not mistaken, on a sea moon in that area there, and, and, and they were badly beaten, people were very badly beaten because there was a general strike. There was a general strike which had been supported by the business community, and Boris and they were part of that, with respect to the independence of Grenada, the independence constitution, yes, and, 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 and Gary's thugs and the police beat people mercilessly. And then there was another protest action where students were taking part of it in St. George's when Morris's father was killed by a member of the Mongoose gang. When Morris's father tried to protect some school girls downtown in St. George's and Morris's father was killed. And, and then, so there was a lot of repression. Um, and then you had the denial of the parliamentary route in 76, as Merle correctly described. So March 13th really was, was, was the only option for trying to bring about, you know, a change in, 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 in power, political power in Grenada. So I wanted to support Merle on that point. Um, and and I, I will stop there. There's so much more to be said, but, but we need to open up. Um, to, to David, can I just give a couple more minutes before we open up? But I think our important points on this discussion is to look at the year 1979, uh, 40 years ago, that, uh, that we're examining today. What was the world like back then, 1979, 40 years ago? What were the correlation of forces uh, at, the, at the global level? How do we connect the dots? How do we look at the Grenada Revolution within the large context of the Cold War that existed back then between the, um, the emergence of neoliberalism, uh, particularly coming after the overthrow of Pinochet in, in 1973 in Chile, right, um, by the CIA and, and the international brainchild behind that was Henry Kissinger. So there was a lot happening, in, beginning to happen in our region at the time that the revolution came into power. 
1979 itself was quite a remarkable year. I think uh, the mighty Sparrow himself made a calypso of 1979. Sure. Yes, in fact, uh, there's so many earth-shaking things that happened in 1979. Let us go down a couple of them very quickly. Um, in January of 1979, he had um, the triumph of the Iranian Revolution in Iran, right, led by the Ayatollah, that uh, ushered in the first Islamic state in the world and still is today, okay, 40 years later, or well, whatever you think of Iran. But that, 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 that revolution happened in the beginning of 79. Then came Grenada, right? And then in, in July came Nicaragua with the Sandinistas, 1979. That's a few months after Grenada uh, came to power. And then later on in the year, they overthrew Idi Amin in, um, uh, in Uganda, in Africa. All of these things happened in the same year. You know, it, it is quite remarkable. Uh, but uh, I, I wanted us to, to, to reflect on that and to, to see how far we have come since then, you know. Uh, uh, but I, I had the opportunity of traveling. Let me just say this. The, 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 the impact that the Canadian Revolution had on this kind of world 40 years ago was truly disproportional enormous to its size, right, to its size, as a small character, uh, it was it was amazing. So, and I traveled around the world with Maurice as his press secretary, and I could see this firsthand in the various meetings that we had with heads of state, high government, uh, level officials, the conferences, uh, like the, the UN, annual UN General Assembly conference, the kind of line meetings around the world, that we all, Grenada had a presence formidable present in all of these global fora. As you say in boxing terms, we were punching way above our weight back then, you know. So I just wanted to, to contextualize it uh, in terms of global history of the period, 40 years ago. Thanks. Thanks so much, um, Don. It was important to remind us of the global context back then because we have to look at the global context now. It's similar when we think of what has happened or what has been happening in Latin America and the, and the rise of right-wing policies and imperialism. We, it's almost 40 years later and we, we are back in that kind of um, hostile world. But I think it, it has to do with, as humans, struggling to determine what kind of world we want to build, what kind of society we want to build. And clearly, Boris Bishop and the Grenadians decided on their own path 79. Um, and so I guess these are some of the fundamental questions we have to ask ourselves uh, today. And I think David, when you were talking about how do we bring about fundamental change, how do we um, change the economic relations of power, then you gave a very concrete example as to what is our society right now. Um, but I want to open it up uh, a little bit. I do believe the Cuban ambassador wanted to say something very short, something from Fidel. And uh, then I believe that our Pearl wanted to share something with us as well. So we open it up to the floor. And we're going to get a second mic. So we're going to move the mic to the uh, center seat. To the, the mic. Okay, 
<laughs> In the farewell of the duel to the foreign heroes on an equal fight against the imperialism in Granada, uh, I would like to share some fragments of that moment. The United States government despised Grenada and hated Bishop. It wanted to destroy the process and example of Grenada. He had even prepared military plans to invade the island, as Bishop denounced almost two years ago. This is in November 1983. But he found no pretexts. The United States was creating pretexts. I was remembering when he was talking. Why they, they didn't do it in me, they were creating also pretexts in order to, to yes, as they, and I'm, I'm quoting this because it's happening now, nowadays. Yes. The story is going on. To justify the invasion of Granada and its subsequent acts, the United States government and spokesman said 19 lies. And he quotes the lies, the lies for example, American students were in danger of being taken hostage. Um, Cuba had the possibility of, in the COP attack and the death of Bishop. Um, the main objective of the invasion was to protect the life of the American citizens. Um, and the, the airport on the construction was not civil but military. And a lot of lies that because, and she was saying before, the, the, mach, the machinery, and also was saying uh, Don, about the, the context and, and how to, to make all that, that propaganda against a, a project, a social project, that wanted to, uh, to, to, to propose the welfare of its people. Then, uh, today, I, I, and there is also this part is so very important. This in Nicaragua, over the price of forty thousand lives paid, paid to win freedom, almost one thousand children of that noble people have been already died as a result of the attacks of the mercenary bands organized, trained, and supplied by the government of the United States. In El Salvador, more than fifty thousand people have been killed by the genocidal regime, whose army supplied, trained, and directed by the United States. In Guatemala, more than 100,000 people have died at the hands of the repressive system installed by the CIA in 1954, when it overthrew the progressive government of Arbenz. And how many have died in Chile since imperialism promoted the overthrow and murder of Salvador Allende? How many have died in Argentina, in Uruguay, in Paraguay, in Brazil, in Bolivia in the last 15 years? How expensive it has cost our people in blood, sacrifice, misery, and mourning the imperialist domination and the unjust social system that it has imposed on our nations. And I wanted to share uh, this because, I was, as I was saying, the history today repeats itself. A whole conventional war has been unfolding against Venezuela. The same contraptions, creations, pretexts, fabrication of lies, misinformation, economic boycott, sanctions, sabotage. They intend to put an end to the example of the Bolivarian Revolution and the obstacle it represents for the imperial domination of our America in our North Western America, the Martian concept. And to be able to appropriate its vast oil resources. This forum today helps not to forget the sad, the sad and painful history that our people have lived and the history that teaches us, that reminds us that tell us with a strong voice what the real imperial purpose are in the region. I wish to conclude with a sentence in, in, of this in speech I was saying before. Imperialism insists on destroying symbols because it knows the value of symbols, of examples, of ideas. But symbols, examples, ideas cannot be destroyed. And when their enemies believe they have destroyed them, what they have actually done is multiply them. So uh, we thank you very much again. Let's honor the history of our America, America, to preserve the future.
Her Excellency Tanya Diego Olite, thank you very much for reminding us of the words of the Commandante himself, Fidel Castro. As you, we all know Fidel and, and Maurice were very, very close. And I think that came out in all the different um, interactions from all of the panelists in terms of the role that Cuba played in assisting that project. And also to remind us, of course, that imperialism is a real thing. In case we think it's something we read in our history books about Nicaragua in the 70s or Brigada in the 80s, it is unfolding in our lifetime right now as we speak. Um, so I think it's, it's very apt that we are having this forum and the relevance of this forum and the relevance of the symbol of the Grenadian Revolution and, and what it meant and what it continues to mean to all of us. So I think I would like to invite Pearl and then I'll ask uh, Roberta, who has also would like to make an intervention. Thank you very much. Everybody can hear me? Yes. Thank, you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I'm, I'm grateful for the discourse of Dawn and Google and English. I just want to make, I have a poem that I wrote for Moses. And David will remember it was the very night of the morning of which he was killed and we gathered in the front square and bawled and bawled and bawled. It was still very emotional for me. I want to speak as an artist. The time of the revolution was a very exciting and fulfilling one for us. People like Moon Collins, Merle, and Daye, Laming, Gugiwati Ongo, people from the region came to Grenada. I heard more Calypso in Grenada on the radio than in Trinidad. I heard my poetry more often on the radio in Grenada than in Trinidad. When Maurice was killed in October, I was preparing, I have done a stage version of Seattle's Mintian, which was shown at OWTU. And um, Nello himself had been there, and Maurice wanted it in Grenada. And I was doing the rehearsals here with people like Errol Jones and all these great artists who had given time and energy to Grenada. And we heard the news, and I've been trying to call Jackie, trying to call Maurice trying to call me and I can't reach anybody. And then that fateful morning. Um, even from the inception of the revolution, and I'm glad that they talked about it, there were ideological differences that were clear and painful and that caused the the revolution to implode. And as Merle said, Maurice came out of the assembly of the people. He believed he validated the country. He believed in the institutions of our people, the Kumbai, the Convoy, the Pranchayats. He believed in those things as institutions in which we could govern ourselves without necessarily looking outside for ideologies which were alien to the way our people live. And that implosion was what destroyed the greatest thing that could happen in the region. And I, as an artist, remain very bitter about it. <coughs> because the revolution was not only Grenada. Green and Jack had great links with the NGN. And Daye and Yeesuka Kwayana in Guyana were part of the NGN. People in Yulu that we call St. Vincent. And there was a kind of burgeoning of people power that all was destroyed by this stupid ideological infighting that destroyed the greatest thing that could have happened in the region. And we still keep 
looking outside of our people for ways to govern ourselves. Yes. When our people, our traditions, we have created the institution. If we were just looking inside ourselves rather than outside. I have no more tears. Those ducks have been put through a river stage. I saw as bled for Walter Rodney, Mikey Smith, for Beverly Jones, for Basil Davis, for Guy Harewood, and many more. Now for Maurice Mosjaki. My generation bleeds, giving blood in hope of giving life. I have no more tears as mother. I feel my womb twist in pain for those who mourn sons' daughters. As woman, I feel the aching in my guts for those who lose husbands, lovers. As child, I feel the fearful void of parents gone to green the earth they loved. I have no more tears, but still they come and run out from my entrails, leaving the painful guts dry, flaccid, still seeking to climb the courage to go on through mists of tears that will not be denied. My generation bleeds. The brave is strongest, spill their blood in hope, and powers large loom to fight battles of ideology, carried lands, and powers large loom to push alien concepts in our midst, the line often canted myths of sovereignty. I watch my generation bleed. I cry inside, Maurice, Maurice, Maurice. I have no more tears. But still they come unbidden, history cycle, Danton Robespierre, Bolshevist, Menelik, Lubertu, Christophe, black blood shedding, vain pursuit of alien ideologies, all armed to re-enslave power to don the masks of ideology. In search of power, we turn into our own entrails, Eat our own flesh, drink our own blood from ritual calabashes, grind our own bones to dust. I'm predicted to the eyes of power. The love power fades, neglect you. The love power fades, reject you now as weakness. And frightened people face the final holocaust, fearing you to cling together in love that alone can save us. I have no more tears, but still I have cause to weep. I agree with you on that doctrinaire point, uh, but at the risk of, of sounding, sounding over simpler about this, 
I think that uh, people would understand more if we were to say, and it is accurate, that Maurice and those around him uh, were more enamored, uh, were, were more impressed with the, the type of socialist model that was being practiced in Cuba as opposed to the type of socialist model that prevailed in the Soviet Union and in other Soviet countries. Um, they, there was a, a tendency on the, on the part of uh, those who supported um, Bernard uh, and to, uh, by extension, Trevor Monroe from Jamaica, uh, who was a very important ideological influence on Bernard and his supporters during, during, even before the revolution came to power. Uh, they, 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 they tended to, to, to look more towards Moscow for their, for their guidance and for their um, models. Uh, and we uh, became enchanted with what we thought was a model that would never work in the concrete context of the Grenadian, of Grenadian history and of Grenadian culture. Uh, so there was that rip, there was that tension, that difference as well. But, but she's right, there was nothing doctrinaire about uh, uh, Maurice Bishop's approach to, this, to these questions, as long as he was absolutely fixated on the question of involving the masses of people who need it in everything that revolution did. Involve the masses, involve the masses. That was his mantra. Um, and he was, he was more concerned about the popularity at the grassroots level of the revolution than with the fine points of, uh, of, of ideological, uh, ideological debate. Mike is off. Mike is off. Yeah, I could see. I could hear. Yeah. yeah. And, and once again, it is it is hard for, for me to put it into words, but um, that business of free speech and the detaining of people and all of that has I've given that given that a lot of thought. But let me see how I can project it. I I was there and I understand better why why how people's um, revolutions and people's um, alternative paths can get distorted in a way into, into those things. Um, people, people were, were tied up, you know, there, there, there were some people, and I, 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 I never was expressing it myself, but, um, you know, the, the question of, of, of elections, all right? Um, I think that may, may have been an arguing point as well, because what, what I am somebody, you know, quite close to the people, that, it, that, it, that, that I don't mean the people in the, in the broader sense, but somebody who was quite close to the leadership, the leadership told me that um, one, one, one of the reasons that they um, clapped down on Morris is that he began talking about holding an election soon. And the, the, the thing is that they saw elections, as well as other things, and the, the famous freedom of speech, there are many things that that um, create that they saw as creating um, ways in for the for the, the, the US to, to, to you know to work their way their way. In. I can neither defend it nor condemn it. What I'm saying is that I understand why under harassment and being under siege, um, you know, creates creates these things which which I suppose we, we see as as um, as, as the distortions. And and they, they were I suppose distortions because um, we, we take those things for, for granted. Alright? So I I don't know if that is to say enough, but all I can say is that I was there and I can see why that happens in regimes especially not, not especially um, in regimes where a country is trying to take a part different from what the U.S. approves of. I, and um, I'm happy that John was able to, to, to do the expansion of the point of the country because Morris was accused of, of abandoning the revolution and undermining the revolution and all of that because he would not subscribe to something that was ready made. Yeah. Thank you.
let me just add two, two quick things to that. One, that word mentioned the sense of siege. I, I remember going in once um, for a meeting, um, and I, I went in and did some work well at the airport, or what was passing by and picked up an airport, something like that. And of course, Vincent was assassinated, he was murdered on October, October 19. Um, he was actually to deliver the feature address at the Holy Hughes Annual Conference of Evidence on the 23rd or 24th, and he was murdered on the 19th of October. So when Vincent picked up, he, he was driving himself, but on his back seat, he had his AK-47 on the back seat, right? Now, when I asked him about it, it was in the context of a real fear by the leadership of an imminent invasion. There was a very real sense that something was going to happen. And this was after June 13th, June no, June 19th, June 18th, around there, 1918, if I'm not mistaken, where there was a rally and there was a bomb on the stage. Yeah, June 19th. June 19th. And there was a young girl <coughs> who was killed and a number of others, a school girl, if I remember, and a number of others were, were badly injured. So, I think one of the things, and, and part of the, the warfare, Thing is also psychological warfare that generates um, a, a dynamic amongst the leadership which which also has other impacts. I can't measure them, I can't judge them, I'm just saying that my view there was really that sense of, of, of them being under siege and so on. Some of the possible introduction I think but I'll leave that maybe for the government. Thank you, I'd like to invite um, Gregory and then we'll uh, kill him. All right? Um, as he makes his way, let's just say we must know that part of all the siege warfare. The United States have mastered that. They know exactly once they see something new that is not in their thing, they have mastered that art. And we have to be very careful as we analyze things that we do not analyze it in isolation too. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, good afternoon, sorry. So, so um, this is a for me an emotional uh, moment because I and, and I really wanted to come here when, when I was given the invitation, and it's because I was one of the early volunteers in Grenada. Um, at that time, I was at UV. Um, completing a master's degree and I packed up thesis and everything and I just packed my bags and I went to Grenada. Um, I did it for two reasons. One is because I wanted to, to, to be part of that movement and secondly because I'm Grenadian or at least from Grenadian roots. Both my parents are Grenadian um, and I have family there. So, so that it was important for me to make my contribution once given the opportunity I don't know if you recall that, that uh, Trevor Farrell was, was then working with the government and he took myself and all his other graduate students over to Grenada. Uh, we probably worked for about nine months in Grenada. Um, yeah. No, it was, it was just general economic planning. Um, the, the statistics was in a mess and everything was in a mess and we were there put it, putting things together. My assignment had to do with the import of petroleum products and, and the retail fuels market and all that kind of stuff that we had to put information together on. And so that nine months was my contribution to the revolution. I think I, I want to say, just make about three points about my observations there and, and, and my thinking about, about what happened um, subsequently and perhaps the lessons that, that, that I have learned. Uh, during, during that, for that, that whole experience of the Greener Revolution. What struck me very early on in the early days was the enthusiasm of the youth, the commitment of the people of Grenada to the thing. I mean, like, everybody knew all the slogans, everybody was engaged, high spirit of volunteerism. I've never seen a people so fired up. I've simply never seen that in my life and seen more people fired up. 
The second point is for me, the second lesson for me was the the the, the new production system and, and, and Warner, sorry, Warner mentioned it. Um, and, and he spoke about, about the, the food processing factory and you recall it, the, 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 um, the mango nectar, I recall the sauce up and the tambourine nectar. I mean there has never been a better food drink in the Caribbean. I don't care what they tell me. You know this thing was just super and they were making this stuff and trying to grow the export market for it and so on and of course I didn't even know the place was going down. Um, so it's possible for me, the lesson is for me, when it's quite possible to, to fire up a people if you could build that spirit of nationalism and commitment and ownership in them uh, to do things about, for them and with their stuff and with the, with, with, with the ingredients for them, I think it's quite possible, you know. Um, and, and for me, again, the third lesson thing that I saw is, is what has been mentioned here earlier on about Maurice and the people of, of, of nice things happening, but people need hope. You always have to give people a hope about the future because the poor can't wait forever. They have to, if they have to wait for things to change, they have to have hope. And for him, that airport was the most essential piece of infrastructure for Grenada because it meant opening up the export market, it meant more passengers, it meant more people, it meant more goods, more services, it meant a safer place. And that, what, that, I mean, that's why that airport is still important. I think it, is, it, is, it was just that the government uh, of the, the day of today, was it Keith Mitchell that named me about after Morris Bishop? Yeah, I think that, that you know, that's, that's a fitting tribute for him and his work um, um, in, in, in among the Grenadian people. Um, so, so when I reflect on Grenada and what I saw in Grenada and what has happened in Grenada, I always think about what's happening in Trinidad, you know, um, you know, and, <laughs> you know. What, you know, how do you, how do you fire up these people here, you know? Um, I, you know, I, 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 do, I really don't have the answer, but I must say I admire the work being done by the MSJ in terms of moving the communities. I think, of course, you must do that work in terms of engaging the communities and engaging people. And the term I use these days is finding what people's pain points are and working on the pain points. And I think that's the most important thing that, that politicians need to do now. Identify what the real pain points are. And, and that's how you have to win people because we can't wait for the repression that was in Grenada. I mean, part of what fired up the people of Grenada is the extent of repression under Gary. And that made sense for people to then to then put the rally behind Maurice and them because they provided that hope. But in this town, you know, we could talk about all oh, people suffering and so on, but carnival and all that. No. 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 <laughs> right? So but they have genuine pain points. And I think I think we need to begin to look at those things in order to rally people behind us. Yeah? So that's my, my contribution. Thank you very much. not just a nostalgic reminiscence of 40 years ago, but people are linking in a concrete way uh, our own realities here. Yeah. Yeah, that is powerful. Let me invite uh, Ola Kele. Pleasant afternoon to all. Ola Kele Masutungi. Greetings and thanks to the BIGW, to OWTU, to Movement for Social Justice, for all the panelists, Your Excellency, and all involved. And one of the things I want to suggest here, and it came up several times from John and other people, whereas the specific is the Grenada Revolution, it is obvious from all the linkages that we made that it is more than a Grenada Revolution. In fact, Caribbean people from 1937, a new era, from 1937 coming up to the current moment, there have been several pieces of revolutionary action taking place 
for workers to define for themselves their rightful place in the scheme of things where those who labor must hold the reins. So one of the things that we need to do is to have proper tools of analysis of our current situation so that we would be able to now utilize this analysis to be able to take or create a forum or a medium of moving forward. And to me, one of the mistakes that we have made continuously, and Akbar N2 has made some references to it, yourself uh, have made some references to it, in the sense that in drawing examples of uh, Comrade Maurice, some people were saying he was using the medium that the people like, things that were current here. And in fact, in the 10-point program that you please, and that 10-point program is important because you would also see that in the Black Panthers Party, they had a 10-point program. You would see the same revolutionary spirit. And in fact, the last two that you call, don't, you don't have to look at it in public now. You would see exactly he was really looking for the liberation of a people globally. So one of the things that that people that we are analyzing, which is ourselves, the word that we use and the, 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 the methodology that we use to analyze, we use something that is based on matter, material, and property only, and we forget that we have spirit. Spirit is part of the paradigm. All of the old world peoples and all of the new world peoples. In other words, from the indigenous people, Wara, Kalinago, Tolnex, Incas, all of those in the Americas, North and South, had a spiritual base. And it was that spiritual base that helped them to fight their revolution. But why people have a spiritual base too? Because even the American Revolution, Madame Blavisky and all these people had an agenda that they were pushing inside America. So I suspect that to a large extent, that unless this new paradigm of analysis of our situation involves the spiritual paradigm and therefore utilizes the mechanisms provided with the spiritual paradigm in conjunction with that on the material paradigm that is revealed. And a lot of what was spoken about about the revolution was also said, especially in New India, that culture was a big thing. So I'm going to close with this statement by a fellow called Professor Yusef Ben Yokanan. Because when we start to talk spiritually or religion and some people say, that, well, no, that, that, I don't think I work with. Even Kwame Ture, who promoted scientific socialism as his pathway, one of the things that we would, Professor Ben said is that religion is culture deified. Thank you. Discussion coming from the floor, so I'm encouraging. We have a few minutes still. Um, I will take about three, four more. Why? Put on your mind. It, it, uh, it is on. <laughs> but you <use> said it. <laughs> it's not coming through here. It oh, it's probably just okay. How is this? You're yeah. talking. <laughs> All right. So, we still have a few minutes for a few, uh, few more interventions, so let me invite, again, from the floor, anybody, anybody who wants to just say a few words or ask a question. As you can see, the panelists, um, are, all of them are willing to answer even the very difficult questions, the, the uh, hard questions that has to be asked. Um, yeah, come. We, because we're going to have like a closing statements. <laughs> yeah. All right. So. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, comrade. Good afternoon, all comrades. I just have two questions quickly. Um, one for the comrade Don. Sorry, David Forb, General Secretary, Postal Workers Union. Comrade Don, I would have heard you say earlier on of the general experience of the comrade bishop. But can you share with us briefly the whole question of your personal interaction with him in terms of you know, how you would have worked with him and how he would have worked with you in terms of social justice? Yes. Wait, wait, hold on, hold on. Oh. And the other question to Sister Merle, I would have heard you make mention of the IMF. And of course, you would have given a brief in terms of 
the unemployment issue and the question of how the IMF would have given statements relative to GDP. Can you tell us if the bishop-led government at the time would have borrowed from the IMF? I'm not certain about that. Okay. Well. Right, okay. Thank you for sharing that. Because we really, I heard you really, that, that term raised a red flag for me as it relates to the issue of that here. Sure. So thank you very much. All right. That's all done. Before you answer, we'll just take a couple more so that you can factor responding to those questions as part of the closing. I think that will be. Oh, okay. Yeah? Right. yeah. Gregory, and I'm going to. I'll, two more, right? I, all right. That's one, two. Going once, going twice. All right. Party done. <laughs> right, good afternoon everyone, I'm Gregory Fernandez from the MSG. Yes, um, my, my, my issue is, um, you know, the whole question of the Caribbean's position and Caribbean unity in this period here where we have Al Capone running the US, right? Because, you know, he's threatening everybody and, and, you know, the whole question of sanctions, they're talking about using secondary sanctions so anybody who support them, what they want to do in Venezuela, etc. And the whole question of Caribbean unity, because even though CARICOM took a, a united position recently, I am not too sure that within CARICOM it also have different tendencies. Right? Because it have some who prepared to bow to the US pressure. Because, uh, you know, they, they see you know, they're they not prepared to stand up, right? Even though they know it's bullying going on. I mean, up to yesterday, the U.S. government said they're banning the ICC, the International Criminal Court. They're banning them from coming to the U.S., taking away their visa, because they want to investigate America for war crimes, right? So, and this bullying attitude, right? Uh, particularly in this period where this whole America first thing is the U.S. see that they decline, the rise of China, etc. I think uh, if you look at the history of the world, it's a quite dangerous period when you have superpowers where one might be um, getting ahead of the next. And, and the, the, the one would decline and trying to reimpose the position all over the world. Right? So, I mean, we have to look at that and, and see what we also need to do to strengthen Caribbean unity in this situation because to me the Caribbean has been one of the places to because of, of the as she was as Mul was saying we could punch you know above our weight on the international scene. So our position as a united CARICOM, which is represents about nineteen votes or whatever, is important in the international economic forums where we can help restrain the violence of the US against people all over the world. And I think it's important for us to come up with a position to also strengthen Caribbean unity in this period. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Gregory, uh, for reminding us about that. I saw that yesterday. And I really want us to, as we reflect on Grenada 40 years on, on let that sink in a bit, because I saw it yesterday, that they ban the ICC investigators from coming to the United States to investigate war crimes committed in Afghanistan, you know? I mean, let that sink in. Could you imagine if any other country put God out their thoughts and say they're going to ban the International Criminal Court investigators from coming to investigate your country for war crimes? You'd be demonized. And in, in fact, they would look for a quick invasion. Syria. Syria. So, I mean, it is real. Now, this is the point we're making, that we are not having an abstract discussion, a theoretical discussion. We are not like in a room of historians just reflecting on times of uh, our time of the past. We are speaking about real things that are happening right now in our region that can cost the bloodshed of 
thousands of people, thousands of people right here in our region. So, um, having said that, let me invite the last intervention from the floor. Uh, First Vice President of the Oilfield Workers Trade Union, uh, Comrade Carlton Gibson, who himself, like Maguire, <laughs> and, um, you know, just sitting there and thinking back, as a young, well, I'm a Caribbean, I'm a Caribbean man. <laughs> My father is Gibson, and, and he's Bajan, right? his father is Bajan. And I thought about the Bajan invasion going to Bajan and interfered with the Bajan so flying fish and so on. But on the greater side, I am a Let and a Radix. My grandmother was Let, and she married a Radix on St. St. George's. I grew up in Grenada and um, was involved in the youth movement in Grenada prior to the, the revolution in 1979. So I left Grenada on the run in 1976. I was involved, I was present when Morris' father got killed at Otway House on the Carnage. I had to deal with the famous Mongo's gang, um, Dudley Passy and, and all those guys, Bob Brisa and kind of punk in my family. But the whole question about Grenada and, and that movement, the young people in Grenada, what took place prior to the revolution, the building up to 1979. I was also a foundation member of the Jewel Movement led by like, Eunice Whiteman, who was a kind of punk in my family. He almost, also taught me at Presentation College in Grenada. And um, the Jewel movement could have pushed the politics just that far. It was basically a agricultural group, organized, grassroots. And um, when, the, when Morris and, and Kendrick Radix and the other guys came in from their studies abroad, they came into the movement and they made a proposal coming in as the movement, the, the, the map, right? The uh, over the assemblies of people, that there was that synergy and there was similarity and they came together to form the new jewel. Uh, I was also a part of that new jewel, right? So they discovered there was a, a, a grouping. Unfortunately, I mean, Cole was able to pull aside and to get some of these guys in Oriel. I knew them. In fact, two months ago, I met one of the butchers of, 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 of St. George's. Eric Hedick Lynn, he thought I'd turn it here and um, we went back to Grenada. It was a classmate of mine, you know? Yeah, he was a classmate, right? And some of these guys, what they, what they came, what they, what they eventually what, they, what, what came out, it is it's sad that they were able to get involved in that kind of, that kind of gathering, the poison. A lot of things cannot be said here today, a lot of things happened in this revolution. There are people who were poisoned. I mean, a lot of good friends and family members who were killed because of their closeness to Morris and the grassroots. Morris was just that. He was a nationalist. And that is one of his faults because they said he was not Marxist enough. But he was people-oriented. It was painful. And even today, if you go back to Greater, the grassroots, the old ladies, the old men, citizens, people of Greenland, they understand the importance of the revolution. And if this revolution was allowed to grow, the whole of the Caribbean would have benefited from it. It's sad that just a few, just a few could have gone out. And I asked Liam two, years, two months ago, I said, listen, you will believe that going that route, you, you opened, you give America an opportunity to come in and to kill the revolution. You eat the, the revolution. Young people, you know, young people, and they were bright. Most of those guys were from Presentation College. Most of them. They were um, James, Liam, James, all those guys. Most of them were young, educated, young men. But they, 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 their mission, you, know, you have to question the mission. It is sad. But notwithstanding that, Greater made a contribution. In fact, I remember um, Comrade Ross, when they had a career club meeting here. The whole of Digo Martin, the whole of Point Fortin, thousands of people went to Hilton to see their Prime Minister, Morris. And they didn't, the security didn't want Morris out. And I'm um, done, and they had to come outside and tell the people, okay, you know. But the whole of Grenada, in fact, I know people who were hiding in Trinidad. <laughs> when he was in the sir, I am Trinidadian. But when, the, after the revolution, they came out, that's my Prime Minister. You see him, you see him, you're on the TV, that's my Prime Minister. And everybody was so happy to be Grenadian. Everybody was happy to be Greener. All of those skeletons, they came out and they identified themselves. You know, and Greener did that. And Greener had to continue growing. It's not the end of the world. It's a lesson, and we have to learn from the lesson. 
And I'm sure coming out of that Grenada situation 40 years ago, 40 years ago was a young fella, very young, you know, <laughs> you know, very young, you know, that the bravery, the fearlessness, that revolution, students marched out of the college, convent ladies marched out from the high school, came down on Otway House and stood in front of these police criminals, Tom Tom Matus with their axe handles and so on, and faced those, those people and turned them up. You know, it was sad, but at the end of the day, that revolution will always be in our minds. I will always remember Grenada and always remember the contribution laid and the comrades who gave their life for the people of Grenada and the Caribbean. Thank you. Thank you very much, Comrade Gibson. I would like the panel now to respond, starting with uh, Don, then Merle, and then David. And that will bring this uh, very uh, powerful, yeah, powerful uh, forum to a close. So Don, All right. I'm putting you back up on the screen. Okay. All right, uh, dear sisters and brothers, comrades, uh, this has been a wonderful forum, a necessary forum, a timely forum, and I want to thank in particular comrade David Abdullah for his kind invitation to me to participate uh, with all of you present this evening. Uh, that for me is a signal honor. I could not think of marking the 40th anniversary of the Grenada Revolution in any other fashion. Uh, even though I am physically challenged these days with my fight uh, against this cancer. But nonetheless, I, I wanted to spend this time because I, I feel that all of us who have survived, we need The U.S. was here in the sound for her, so let's make a quick intervention. General statements have been made already. I just want to bring up a couple, just um, two, two details. Everybody here, let's say that for Okay. Two, two, two details that I forgot to raise. I was glad that David, or maybe it was Don, who, that who we referred to the budget. The, the actual process there I was one of the things I was involved in, although I don't know a, a word about economics there. They used to produce, when I say they, the, you know, people involved in the revolution used to translate the, the budget into human language. And that used to be discussed at Butler House and also among the, in the groups that people had all over the country. So you would have a pretty you will have an understanding of what was the being done and why. Okay, that's one thing. And I, there was one little detail about the harassment that I remembered. We used to hear airplanes <coughs> overhead. The, the, the airport was up in pearls. And just hearing an airplane overhead, it was part of that um, fear that people had of the invasion that time. I actually brought my child home at a certain time because I wasn't going to be there because we were so expecting an invasion. Right? But you understand the thing about the airplanes. Airplanes don't pass over that, didn't at that time pass over that end of the island. So you would hear planes coming and hovering low to look at you and all that kind of thing. All of that is, is what took place in terms of pushing you into, in, in, into behavior that, that, um, you know, that looked like um, betraying the, the ideals. Um, okay, I just want to say um, finally that I agree with, with, with Quasi that there has to be fuller discussion of October 25th. But I think that belongs on the anniversary of, of, of October 25th. Today we're celebrating the birthday of the revolution. I mean, why we should raise it every time we talk? That a full discussion there would not be appropriate, I think, for March 13th. Okay. Okay, I think, we, do we have, do we have Don uh, back? Okay. Yeah, can you hear me all right? Yes, we, yes, okay. go ahead. Uh, I don't know how much of the very first Couple of sentences. I suggest you start completely from the beginning. Again? Yeah. All right. Very good. Okay. I'll try to be very brief then. Um, so I was saying to all of you present, I just wanted to express my sincere gratitude uh, to uh, Comrade David 
for the invitation to participate in what has been a wonderful forum. Um, I commend him and his party for taking this initiative. I don't know if there are a whole lot of other similar discussions taking place uh, anywhere in the Caribbean uh, at this particular moment. Although there have been there have been uh, conferences and so on uh, in in other parts of the region, but but doing this doing this at the level of political activists is um, is quite unique. Uh, and that's, that has always been my perspective working for the Grenada Revolution as a, as a journalist who is an activist, an activist who is a journalist. That's, 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 that's been my, what I bring to the, to the table. Uh, the truths from Grenada over the past 40 years are both comfortable and uncomfortable, you know. And the final judgments are left up to our historians to come. Um, question of how will history judge the Grenada Revolution? Well, in my view, history is not fixed. It is fluid. It, it must be understood both in the historical context and within the proper perspective. You know, we need to always try to connect the dots. That's one of the lessons I have learned from the Grenada view. That we live in a, a, a world. We don't just live in a tiny island or a or a, or a landlocked nation. We live in a world today, you know. And there are forces in the, in, 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 in the contemporary world in which we live that, that uh, change the levers. You know, they make the decisions. And we, we need to be aware of that. Um, I just want to also comment very briefly on what the young man who was a grad student uh, in Grenada, uh, what he said about uh, about uh, about naming the airport for bishop, which I which is a laudable thing, and uh, we commend all of those who uh, were involved in that decision. But on the other hand, uh, you still have a government in Grenada that considers October the 25th, which is the date of the U.S. invasion, Liberation Day. They call it Liberation Day, and it is a national holiday in Grenada. That is an abomination. I should not. And I, that is a slap in the face of the Grenadian people, both in Grenada and, and outside of Grenada. And that, that, needs to, that needs to be uh, lifted up. Um, you know, I just want to finally bring to your attention a remarkable speech that the former Prime Minister of St. Lucia, Kenny Anthony, gave in Grenada just within the last couple of days. And I have had a chance to read the speech. Uh, and um, I don't know, David, we could, we could find a way maybe to get it circulated or the comrades in. But it's quite a remarkable speech. In, in, and very from the heart, it, she talks about his relationship with the Grenada Revolution and with the Grenadian revolutionaries, both with Maurice and with Bernard Ford. Uh, and um, in, 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 the, in the piece, he also said, uh, it talked about the, the, the impact that it has had on the progressive and left movements throughout the, uh, the Caribbean region. Uh, and, but also he, he pointed out, and I'll end this, he said, he said, now is the time, now the time has come, put aside all the differences, ideological differences, but the time has come 40 years later to elevate Maurice Bishop to the pantheon of prevailed revolutionary. I'm putting a rip from this piece that he, the, the speech that he gave. He said, at my distance, I continue to fight the effort to search for forgiveness, to urge reconciliation, to preach tolerance, and to find peace. Long live the memory of the Grenada Revolution. May the legacy of Maurice Bishop forever remain in the hearts and breasts of men and women of Grenada, our region, and our empire. Uh, and I would also think long live memory of the Grenada Revolution. The Grenada Revolution is not by any means dead. The ideas that fueled it are very much alive, both in the minds and hearts of the Grenadian people and those people outside of Grenada who continue to fight for justice. So, um, you know, as Peter used to say, Grenada is, a, is and continues to be a big revolution in a small country. <laughs> Uh, and so it has dramatic and truly significant impact on our part of the world and indeed on the world as a whole. So but what has been done today is commendable and um, 
and again for the invitation to participate in this discussion. Thank you very much, Don. Let me also thank Don and Merle for their contributions and, and for all the questions and comments on the floor. Um, there, were, there were a number of people um, who contributed their, their, their knowledge, their, their intellectual capacity and so on to the Guinea Revolution. So, for example, um, I never want to mention Professor George Sammy, who was, of course, pioneered a lot of work in terms of using local foods and processing local foods and so on. Um, Dr. Trevor Farrell was, was, was very much part of that process as well. And um, in terms of the question of the IMF, of course, um, all countries, of, virtually all countries, are members of the IMF. And, and therefore, annually, the IMF will do uh, article, what's known as an Article 4 consultation, and produce a report or an analysis of the state of your economy. And often the IMF has a better handle of the state of your economy than, than, than a lot of people locally have a handle of the state of the economy. But there, just in terms of the data and so on, but their prescriptions, their policy prescriptions, of course, are very much in keeping with their own ideological and political intent. So um, the, the, they cannot force a country to implement their policy recommendations um, unless you are in debt and therefore you go to the IMF and you borrow money and then as part of the conditionality of the loan you are required to implement their policy agenda so that Grenada was not um, in a situation where they required IMF um, support by way of IMF quote-unquote loans or anything like that and therefore they didn't have to implement any IMF programs but the IMF would have done an annual economic assessment of the state of the Grenada economy. I think that is what Merle and others have referred to. Now there was a Grenadian economist who was working with the IMF who assisted the Grenadian government during that period and that person was Davison Budi, who later on exposed the IMF statistical fraud in Trinidad and Tobago in the 80s um, and when, when um, the IMF said that the, 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 the relative unit labor cost of Trinidad and Tobago was at a certain level when Budu claimed it was not. And on the basis of that, Trinidad and Tobago was actually um, squeezed out of, of certain kinds of loan arrangements with international donors because international donors would not have lent Trinidad and Tobago. This would have been in the Chambers government period, um, 81 to 86. Um, because if the IMF gave you a bad report when they did the Article 4 consultation, people would not lend you because they may feel you would default. Now, I, I, in my analysis of what, of why the IMF did that, um, I, my conclusion, and I have no hard evidence of it, but this is my conclusion of adding up one and one and coming up with two, was that the Trinidad and Tobago government in October of 1983 had a very progressive and, and Chambers must be congratulated for a sterling position of maintaining no to US military intervention because George Chambers was the chairman of CARICOM at the time and there was an emergency CARICOM meeting at the Hilton and John Donaldson related this story to Errol McLeod and myself when we met with John. John he was Minister of Foreign Affairs and Minister of National Security. When we went to him saying we wanted the support of the Trinidad and Tobago government for having the only memorial service for Morris and Jackie and Unison and Vincent and, and all the others who were, um, Norris Bain and, and, and the others who were killed. Um, the only memorial that could be held anywhere in the Caribbean was in Trinidad and Tobago. And the only two organized that in December of 1983. Morris's mother came, Marbish came, and, and she's, she's somebody who also needs to be held up as a remarkable woman yes. of strength. Because her husband was killed, Rupert Bishop was killed, as, as Carter Gibson. Morris, her son, her only son, was killed because they had, they, she had two daughters, Anne and, and another daughter. And her, one of her grandsons was killed. Morris's son, who he had with Jackie, Vladimir, was killed in Toronto 
um, in an arbitrary kind of attack. It wasn't a political attack. I don't think it was an arbitrary attack. So she loved and she lived through her husband, her only son, and one of her grandchildren, maybe only grandson Beacon. So she was an amazing woman. But 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 um, Alimenta Bishop came together with Anne, one of the daughters of the memorial service. But John Donaldson and, and, and George Lamming gave the the, the, the the main tribute, spoke of that, a very important statement by Lamming. Um, and at that um, at that discussion with John Donaldson, he gave up almost blow by blow account of what was happening during that CARICOM meeting here because while Chambers and others had gotten CARICOM to a consensus to have a CARICOM team go into Grenada and had been in contact with Corn and Austin and the others and they had agreed to have the CARICOM team come in in an effort to forestall any kind of military intervention. While Siaga and Tom Adams and Virginia they were agreeing around that table in the, went out of the room and were negotiating with Reagan and the U.S. State Department for the invasion of Grenada. And Chambers felt absolutely devastated. So I'm looking at the point that Gregory Fernandez was making because CARICOM was deeply divided as a result of that. Well, I still are, but, 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 but that, the nature of that division then was had the implications that of the support by the OECS and Siaga and Tom Adams for the invasion of, of Grenada. Um, and and the, the, there were four governments that opposed that, Trinidad and Tobago, Bahamas under Pinley, Guyana under Burnham, and Belize, I think under George Price, if I'm not mistaken, right? And my my link of what the IMF did was that that was one way for the U.S. to, to, to get back at Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I, that's just my one-on-one -on -one made five, but <laughs> it might very well be, be so. So that's just a link the IMF issue. And, and with respect to, to CARICOM, CARICOM integration and the threats, because we know that there's a Lima group, and some CARICOM members are members of the Lima group, including Jamaica, um, Barbados was, but they've, they've kind of pulled out of that. Um, St. Lucia is, and so on, um, Guyana is. So, with respect to that, we have upcoming in August, the 8th Assembly of Caribbean People, and that will be a very important space for everyone here. We send everybody an email who's here about it, who hasn't gotten, because it's very important at the level of Caribbean people, we, we mobilize our unity at the level of the grassroots, and so on, in order to try to ensure that pressure is put at the level of governments to maintain Caribbean unity and integration in the face of what is happening today. So that, that's just my response to, to Gregory's point there. Um, the, the, to, the issue of the, the freedom of the press issue, um, if you go to say that, um, but when the torchlight was closed down, which was very early. Don would remember the, the exact date of the torchlight. Maybe 1980, the torchlight was closed. Yeah, it was in the, no, actually, it was in 1979. Oh, 79, okay. It, it was around August of 1979. Right. And so yeah. you went in a little afterwards to start Free West India. Right. Then, then I, when I got to Grenada in October of 1979, I worked as the editor of, of the Free West India, yes. which was then the alternative to what? the revolution of the its own voice as an alternative to the torchlight. Right. Now, I remember a number of us in Trinidad Bay who were, were unhappy about the closure. We didn't think it was the right thing to do. And myself, Rafiq Shah, and Trevor Farrell actually went across and met with the leadership of the NGM and so on to express our views. They expressed their views. There was a difference of, of, a, of, a, of approach about what what was the right thing, but of course it was their decision, not ours. But we just thought that it was going to raise a lot of, of negatives um, throughout the region and, and so on. Um, when, when one of the attacks against Morris in the lead up to, to September 1983, when the Central Committee met um, to, to propose, and it was Liam Ousu James who proposed joint leadership, was um, that Morris was a petty bourgeois Democrat and could no longer carry the revolution further. 
um, and therefore you needed Bernard with his ideological clarity and strength, blah, 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 blah to be able to take the revolution further. Um, that sounds like the classic Stalinist argument. Yeah. Right, and that is where they were proposing joint leadership. And right. in, the, in the famous minutes of those meetings, which the U.S. actually released, and there was a copy, I don't know if it's still in the Education Department's office, but there was a copy of those minutes. Um, George Louisor was, was, was quoted in the minutes as saying um, that he could not find anywhere in the literature reference to joint leadership. And, and it, it, while George was, was opposed to, to, to the um, joint leadership position, but the fact that he had to go to talk about the literature, where in the literature was there joint leadership mentioned, that, that in something by some East German political person, there are no reference to that. I mean, why, why you want to discuss East Germany in the context of Grenada, God only knows. But, but, but it's an indication of, of the fact that, um, as Fidel had said, they become drunk on ideology. I think that was his term. They yes. become drunk on ideology. Um, and, and so, it, it's clear that, that, that there was this view that Morris's style and, and practice of the politics was not in conformity with what they thought was, was necessary to deal with the challenges of the revolution at that point in time. Well, in fact, the opposite was the, tr was the truth because Morris was the only person who could have commanded the respect and regard of the masses of the Grenadian people and therefore taken the Grenadian people in the revolutionary process to whatever next level it had to go. Right, so that's so, correct. Yeah, so I just thought I, I would I would I would mention that without getting into another other discussions because time is running out and we have to have another discussion around this and, and so on. Uh, but but to, and the last point is in relation to so, so Roberto was talking about you know how do we how do we create the new politics and so on and so some of the ideas that we have put out is the idea of the second republic that that we have to evolve from the post-independent state and the state of the first republic, which institutions of state cannot deliver social justice and equity because they buttress the old economic relations of power and, and of status and of privilege and of discrimination on all levels, whether it is discrimination on the basis of class, discrimination on the basis of color, gender, age, race, religion, all of those discriminations, the, the, the state reinforces those discriminations. And, and therefore, we have to create a new state, uh, which is what we call the Second Republic, but which has built into them institutions of, of popular power in different forms and fashions to ensure that those who control the state power do not then abuse that state power, um, which is what ultimately happened in Grenada when Cord and, and Austin um, killed Morris and so on, and then created the RMC. That was turning, which, which was Morris's last comments, right, up on the phone. Um, yeah. um, um, turned the guns on the masses. That's what right. Yeah. yeah. Right, which is the absolute opposite of what the revolution was supposed to be. And therefore, we have to have, in the context of the Second Republic, institutions in the Constitution that um, give real power to people where they work and where they live and so on and ensure that there are real checks and balances on the power of the executive or the cabinet. So I, I will just end there. Yeah. Um, the, the, Amen. Just, um, about the assembly of the people. Am I correct that you all have the last one in the Dominican Republic? I think that that is unforgivable knowing how the Dominican Republic treats Haitians. And one of the things we will never sort out in this region is until we give Haiti the respect for being the mother of all the world. The next one will be in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, so I look forward to full participation of the social movements in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, I would just like to close with two quick things. Um, I think we had a very good afternoon. You all, everybody agree? Yeah. We had a really good afternoon. 
And my, my only little slogan uh, before I close is from the Grenadian Revolution to Trinidad and Tobago's Second Republic. I think it's a journey that all of us, we have to walk, but we, are, we also have to make social justice a reality in Trinidad and Tobago. I think that is the only way we can truly honor uh, Maurice Bishop. Um, today was to recognize the birth, as you clarified, today was to recognize the birth in October. We'll probably have, well, a problem. we'll probably do something, yeah. Uh, to do, continue that analysis as to what went um, awry, but today was meant to be a recognition and a celebration because I think Gregory Maguire, you would have said it was about hope. And therefore, Trinidad and Tobago's Second Republic is about hope. The last thing has to do with something very practical. We all uh, discussed and we saw the link between what had happened 40 years ago and what is happening now. Today is also um, an international solidarity day for Venezuela. All across the world as we speak, um, social movements, progressive forces are engaging in various types of solidarity activity to, to show that um, there are those of us around the world who will not uh, willing to stand up against imperialism. And in that light, what we'd like to do when we have closed here is offer comrades here an opportunity to do short, just very short video clips, um, simply stating that hands off Venezuela. Because at the end of the day, regardless of how you feel, ideological or not, and this is not time to get, as I say, what, drunken with ideology, regardless of how you may feel about President Maduro and the PSUV, it's not about that at this point. It's about an attempt to invade a neighbor that's so close to us that will cost the lives of tens of thousands of people. And if they could do that there because of their oil reserve, we would be little oil reserve. It's just a matter of time. So we also have to take a stand as progressive uh, people. So I invite all those who will be um, who would like to be part of that, just to make a short film, we are going to be sending it across to Venezuela as well as we'll be sharing it with our comrades across the world who also engage in solidarity activity um, activities. So this is just part of us being part of history. So I want to thank everyone for spending this Saturday afternoon with us. We now 10 to 6, um, so, but I think it was a lovely evening. I, I, I couldn't think of a better way to spend Saturday afternoon. Yeah? You all agree with that? <laughs> so give yourselves a round of applause. Thank you.